Right now, our children are more vulnerable and at more risk than children have ever been in human history mm -hmm. because of the internet. And we are in and headed towards the largest public health crisis in human history because of trafficking. And we don't have a task force to fight it. $40 billion a year is spent by the federal government to fight the war on drugs. Yet drugs are everywhere. Our children are being victimized in ways that I can't even put a number to right now because ISPs and big tech hides it. And our government spends $200 million a year to fight this. And big tech spends more money than that to lobby against fighting it. Matt Murphy, <laughs> and welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thanks for having me, brother. Man, I'm uh, yeah. I'm excited to get to talk to you. We've, you know, we talk all the time, yeah. but uh, you know, uh, for the audience, what you've done, what you've created, is, is really uh, incredible. So thank you for uh, for coming on. I appreciate that, Ed. Uh, I mean, everything you've done is incredible too, man. So you're one of my favorite people to talk with. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, we've been working hard, so um, you know. For the, for the audience that doesn't know your story a little bit, um, you know, you were a Green Beret, Special Forces, uh, worked uh, with the CIA, um, and then uh, had an event where your sister was kidnapped and, and trafficked and mm -hmm. murdered. Um, yep. And that was the catalyst for you to found uh, Operation Lightshine. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about, kind of go into more depth of, what went on with that and, uh, you know, how you got to this point and how you're, you know, of course, working with the Sentinel Foundation yeah. now. Oh, for sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, Mom remarried, you know, when I was about 12 years old. And you know, we immediately went from, like, the poor neighborhood, you know, where we were some of the only white kids in the neighborhood, me and my brothers, uh, to, you know, living in nice suburbs, upper middle class. And, uh, you know, life changed a lot, man, but... I, I kind of never got past that that poor growing up. That was kind of ingrained in me when I was young. And because of that, I didn't really appreciate the opportunities that, that I had been given. You know, once I got to go to the private schools and got bought a car when I was 16, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, so I went to college and, you know, I was always pretty intelligent. I don't want to like talk about myself in that way. But, you know, I always made, you know, really good grades until I stopped studying and then I aced every test I ever took and never did homework. Right. Hmm. You know, so, um, I'll never forget. Uh, I, I took the ACT ended up getting one of the highest, uh, scores in the, in the school district and in the state on the ACT. And I was failing high school. Hmm. Right. Uh, so I got called in the principal's office and, and they walked me to class the last six weeks. So I would make sure that I didn't, you know, get any more trouble and, and could graduate. Ended up graduating and got a scholarship uh, to uh, college with a, I think I barely had a 2.0 GPA. Whoa. Yeah, but got a full scholarship, you know, just because of my ACT score. But I uh, continued to screw around and, and uh, party in college, didn't really know what I wanted to be. I joined the military, right? Um, always wanted to do it. Um, you know, I just kind of felt that it was, it would straighten me up, right? You know, like get, get me in line. And it did. You know, so I started off infantry because uh, I had had so many reckless driving tickets. They told me I couldn't get a security clearance to go into special forces. They lied, but, hmm. you know, that's what recruiters do. And tried out for special forces a couple of years later. It's been a career in that. And, man, um, you know, I never, if you looking back, you know, and what I'm doing now, what I'm, it, it, it never crossed my mind or my radar, you know, that, that, that I'd be here uh, doing what I do. I always thought I was just going to be some type of, you know, Green Beret until I retired and then be some intel or, you know, uh, operational mercenary, I guess. Travel the world, you know, do cool stuff and just never really have responsibilities. And life changes a lot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it comes at you fast. And, you know, my little sister uh, was a uh, daughter with my um, stepdad who adopted me. And so I guess real dad, right? Uh, and, and my mom. Uh, so we were half, you know, brother and sister. She grew up in that life of uh, every opportunity, everything handed to her, you know, in Memphis. And uh, she took a bad path, man. She got in with some bad kids and, and drugs, you know, like all, all too many friends. I'm sure we both have from growing up and see what drugs do to people. Um, you know, pills you know, starts with something and start for her. It was pills and, you know, recreational stuff, taking pills from like my parents or, you know, grandparents or others, friends, parents who were sick, 
And then it turned into an addiction, right? And prescription fraud and all that. And then next thing you know, it turns into to heroin and fentanyl. And I was in the military by this point, you know, very far removed from her life. Just my parents kind of gave me cliff notes, but never really told me the truth. And uh, that addiction led her to being kicked out of the house. Um, she I have a niece, uh, cutest little thing in the world. Samara's can be named Bella, which is her daughter. Um, but she had it with the guy who was just a, um, you know, same part of life, I guess she was in complete loser, you know, had no education, no job, addicted to drugs. So my parents had to get custody, take the, take her daughter from her and her life kind of just spiraled after that, you know? Um, so I always say the worse the drugs get, the worse the people get. And she made a decision to, uh, start doing things right. You know, she's probably groomed and coerced into this, but start doing things, selling herself you know, to get the drugs. Cause once you don't have a job and your parents cut you off, I mean, if you're a woman or a man, I mean, really the only thing you have at that point that's valuable to get your fix is, is your body. Right. Uh, so we know for sure that she was trafficked to some extent, you know, before she went missing. Uh, I can't really try to say this right way. I can't really talk about details of the case cause it's still an open investigation. Uh, but I'm trying to say it in the right way. The guy who picked her up when she did went missing, had previously, you know, beaten her to a pulp. And she was so scared of him at that time because he was a drug dealer and, you know, hanged out with crazy people and had some pretty high connections in the in the crime world. Uh, she didn't want to press charges. I know I didn't know about this, of course. My parents definitely kept this from me because I was gone in the military. Uh, but this guy picks her up again, um, November 5th, 2019, 30 minutes later, her cell phone never touched the tower again. And uh, about two months later, uh, Christmas Eve 2019, her body was found in a river in uh, Mississippi. Mm, man. And the we still really don't know, you know what happened to her after she was taken. No, no witnesses will come forward. Nobody will talk about it. The guy that picked her up had an alibi that the police really didn't kind of look into. And, um, you know, we, we just really don't know what happened, but we do know that the, the decomposition of her body did not match being, you know, dead for two months. We know that it's about two weeks is what the, you know, the coroner said. So we just don't know what happened to her, you know? Man. So, you know, that was obviously a, a horrible thing that happened and, and traumatic. And, um, you know, but from that mm -hmm. you decided to, kind of do something about it in a way and give back and, and yeah. try to save people like that. Uh, you know, you founded, uh, operation light shine. Mm -hmm. I remember first meeting, meeting you actually here at East Ivy, yeah. uh, with, uh, you and, and Dustin, uh, <laughs> while jelly roll was doing yeah, a jelly roll music video. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, you know, you had the idea of the story and, um, you know, we've, we've talked about this before you were, you were talking about, possibly me being on the board and, mm -hmm. and doing stuff. But I didn't know you that well then, yeah. you know, and I said, Hey, you know, I'll help. Uh, but I don't think, you know, uh, uh, I'm the right person for the board yet. I want to get to get to know you a little better, really see what, what you're about. And, um, you know, I was impressed. We became good friends and mm -hmm. I got to learn, uh, you know, more about your story and, uh, your values and those type of things. And I, I was very impressed. And, um, you know, but you created Operation Lightshine shortly mm -hmm. thereafter. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from there, it's kind of like a rocket ship for that nonprofit. You, yeah. you did a lot. Talk about what Operation Lightshine uh, is and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your experience starting and how all that can, kind of came about. Yeah. Uh, so w when I started to look into this issue, you know, because the rumors from my sister's death and obviously stories about her life, human trafficking came up and then you know, start to look into human trafficking at this time was during COVID, right? 2000, um, early 2020 world's gone mad. Everybody's stuck in their homes. And the big topic for the, you know, quote unquote conspiracy theorists at that time, right. Uh, was human trafficking and some, uh, charities, some organizations, uh, you know, kind of ran prominence in that time to start fighting it. Mm -hmm. So the operation underground railroad, you know, Tim Ballard and all he was doing, and I saw that and I 
started to look into how they operated and, and I'm not talking crap about them. I just, I didn't agree with some of their methods and tactics and I thought there was a better way to do it. So I kind of looked at, you know, the special operations task force model and how we tackled terrorism. And it wasn't just, you know, special forces. It was the whole military community and government agencies all working together and doing what they're good at to fight, you know, one fight, one common enemy. That was, you know, terrorism. And when I looked at the states and what really tipped this off for me was my, my sister's case. Law enforcement wasn't talking. They didn't work together. There were different levels of, you know, I guess the best word is care or desire to investigate it. Uh, different uh, and really, I mean, I hate to say this. I'm not bad mouthing law enforcement, but different levels of capabilities, and uh, you know, to get the job done. And because of that, my sister's case went unsolved, and a lot of things that should have been done in those early stages, first few hours, first few days, weren't. Mm. But just because of how it was handled. So I realized there's a multitude of problems. Now, without blaming law enforcement, you know, the, the personnel in it, what, what I blame is, is the funding and the capabilities that they're allowed to have. So I started to look at that. And when you're talking about human trafficking and child exploitation, they're very advanced crimes. A lot of it starts in technology that are ran by organized crime networks and, and you know, professional criminals who exploit the system, the, the justice system especially, and then technology to accomplish, you know, this, this evil act. And law enforcement is essentially fighting that with, you know, let, let's be honest, pre-technology tactics and, and training. They really don't know how to police this new, you know, I, I call it reality that we're living in, which is the, the metaverse, if you will, and technology, the internet. They don't really know how to police that until the crime happens in the real world. They have enough evidence and then they can get the warrants and the subpoenas to go back and, and you know, deep dive things. But there's no proactive, you know, effort out there to stop it. There's a lot of reasons we can go into for that. But at the end of the day, law enforcement is just under-equipped, under-trained, under-staffed, under-resourced, underfunded. And, and let's face it, in America today, they're uh, demonized and attacked. So I knew something had to be done about that. So I got with a guy named Jim Cole uh, from Homeland Security. He was um, an active agent at that time. He's retired now. And together we developed uh, a hybrid of the, the Special Operations Task Force model and then a law enforcement task force model. And we, we launched that here in uh, Tennessee. And the goal was to solve all the problems that I just mentioned that law enforcement has by partnering a law enforcement task force, federal, state, and local task force with an NGO. And inside of the NGO, you can create partnerships with other NGOs, companies, you know, different levels of technology, and then equip law enforcement with everything that they needed. And uh, because of Tim Tebow coming on board and, you know, funding this, it, it took off. You know, it does work. Uh, but, you know, the... As the charity grew and as the model expanded, I realized there were some things because of the economy, because of just the way the world works that we needed to do differently. And uh, I'm not by any means saying the light shine model doesn't work. It, it does work. It's just in my mind, it's too much of a burden on the donor, right? Because you have the way that we were able to pull it off is replacing the salary of law enforcement, right? Right with donor money. Well, you get one law enforcement officer with their salary, their benefits, and a vehicle, you're looking at about $140,000, $150,000 per officer, you know, when it's all said and done, a year. And that's just one officer on the task force, right? And that's required to happen to get this task force created if the government doesn't create it because Every law enforcement department in this country right now is underfunded, understaffed, under-resourced, under-trained, right? So that was the way to skin that cat. But what we realized is as we built this model out, man, you're $1.5, $2 million in on a task force, and all you've done is pay the salary replacement. You still got the building, overhead, technology, digital forensics, all the intel support and everything that's needed. And unless the state starts to pick up a lot of that cost— you know, you're, you're going to be over your head real quick. Sure. You know, so uh, I'm very happy of the, the, the task forces that succeeded. Obviously, the, the task force here in Nashville got shut down, reasons I won't go into. 
you know, I don't want to start crap with anybody, but you know, um, we'll be back in a different way. Uh, but, um, it, but Florida is succeeding and Virginia's kicked off and I'm really happy to see this success and to see them continue, uh, to thrive in that model. Uh, but you know, who I am as a person, very outspoken, <laughs> as, as you well yeah. know, uh, I'm always going to say what I believe, even at, you know, when I'm told not to, I don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> you know, you know? <laughs> no, uh, not, I, not at all. I didn't know that. <laughs> uh, and, and I believe there's some very serious things happen to our country. So there was a combination of me trying to change that model that, that people weren't a fan of and a combination of, you know, you know, who I am as a person that did not work when you look at an NGO that becomes that big forward facing, you know, to the public, mm-hmm. you know, where, you know, I was the, uh, the square peg in the round hole, you know, to be in charge of that kind of thing, you know. Um, and, and I realized, you know, through a lot of conversation, people I trusted, you especially, you know, I, I belonged, my talent, my skill set, who I am as a person, it w- is better to be in an organization with people like me. Yeah, right? absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, so now you're with, uh, the Sentinel Foundation. Yes. And, uh, Sentinel Foundation is somewhat like Operation Lightshine, but you actually do missions yes. to, uh, remove... Uh, kids and just people from those, those mm-hmm. situations. Uh, you know, Glenn, uh, David is, has become a friend and, um, mm-hmm. you know, obviously Glenn, uh, did Glenn found the Sentinel Foundation? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And then Glenn's background is really interesting. He was a Delta force operator. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Delta force, uh, Intel support. So Intel he supported support. the operators. Okay. Delta, Delta force Intel support. Yeah. Um, he was, uh, uh, he worked with the CIA mm-hmm. at some capacity as well, um, and he really put it, put together a, an amazing team. Talk about yeah what Sentinel's doing, and uh, maybe even how it differs a little bit from Operation Lightshine. No, oh, definitely. So Sentinel has been operational since 2016, and was started by Glenn Devitt. And this is kind of the the funny part about how our little paths you know connect. Jim Cole, who helped me start Lightshine and build the model with me, uh, he was actually the one who trained Glenn Devitt uh, in digital forensics. Oh, wow. Yeah, so Glenn got injured and uh, in the military and had to be medically retired. When that happens, there's this program that Homeland Security officers called the HERO program. And it's for uh, wounded veterans who are transitioning out uh, to take an internship at Homeland Security to learn to become a digital forensic technician working child exploitation and trafficking cases, right? Because what they found is, is this, you know, it, you know, God help these people because it's, it's so, this is dark, but these are the people that actually have to look at the, the images and the videos and de- forensically investigate everything digital that's taken from these pedophiles and these traffickers, right? So all of this stuff has to be categorized as evidence to get certain levels of charges, Somebody's got to look at it. Somebody's got to categorize it. Somebody has to say, that's a child, that's an adult. You know, this type of sexual act occurred or didn't, right? It, somebody has to watch it. Mm-hmm. You know, AI mm-hmm. and technology hasn't gotten there yet to where it could do it. You know, so these people are just amazing people. But what Homeland Security found is that veterans tend to have a, just because of who they are as people and their service, tend to handle it better. I don't know how you could handle it well. I would lose my mind in one video. Yeah. I'd probably want to go kill somebody. Yeah, I probably would. <laughs> but um, th- these people do it. Now, there is still a high suicide rate and, and, and burnout rate. Mm-hmm. One, of the, one of the digital forensic technicians, I'm not going to say his name, just say it like that, but um, on the, the Nashville task force that we started, he was a hero and he committed suicide a few months ago. Oh. You know? Yeah. It, it just, I mean, can you imagine watching children being raped and molested, you know, hundreds if not thousands of times a, a day? No. I mean, it's you just... Know, just to categorize it as evidence. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, Glenn did that internship, and it was a year long, but at the end of the internship, you have the ability to say, hey, I'm out, right? It's not for everybody. So Glenn didn't say, hey, I'm out, I'm done with this. Glenn said, hey, I'm out, I can't do it like this. And he went and tried to start an artificial intelligence company to create AI that could, you know, decipher the, these images and videos. And because of where AI was and tech was at the time, he wasn't able to ever get it there. So then he started the Sentinel Foundation. And the Sentinel Foundation 
uh, has done some amazing things up until now, mostly all uh, overseas, rescuing kids from, you know, trafficking, responding to humanitarian crisis and all that. Um, there's uh, there's some connections between the T- Tebow Foundation and Sentinel. I won't go into what that is, but that's how I was introduced to these guys. Um, you know, Tebow, we were still in the get to know each excuse me uh, get to know each other phase. You know, before he he gave me the money to start our first task force, and he invited me down to help plan uh, for some Afghanistan like extraction stuff. Right, so I uh, I had already been doing some things in Afghanistan to you know get people out of there. And I flew down, and that's when I first met the Sentinel guys, Glenn and the whole team. I mean, you had one of the guys who founded Delta Force in the room, you know, senators in there, and then you oh, know, wow. a bunch of a bunch of Delta operators. And I just show up, you know, and and I know you don't walk into rooms and you know like that, and you know, start throwing things around. So I just hey man, you know, where can I help? Mm-hmm. And I just helped them get ready to leave. They took off. They operated in Afghanistan for about a month and a half, and I did as well in a different capacity and. We started to, you know, develop some respect for each other. Sure. You, you know, it's uh, our community is a very, you know, siloed community, right? People have to, you know, earn their keep and earn their respect. But Afghanistan, uh, we were able to see how each other operate, but operate very differently because we have different backgrounds and, and techniques. But a lot of things are similar, mm. especially the connections, right? So we both had a lot of success in Afghanistan, you know, helping people, uh, getting people that helped America out of there. Then, um, you know, task force kicks off. I'm dealing with that. But then Ukraine happens. And then we jump right back into Ukraine trying to do what we could over there. Sentinel did as well. Um, you know, so I did all these things as a capacity of light shine, but it wasn't light shine that did it. It was just kind of me going rogue, doing what I'm good at, you know, and, and letting light shine do what they do. Um, and, and that's when I started to realize, hey, you know, like this light shine thing is great. I built it. It works. But, you know, who I am as a person, my value to this organization, now I'm done. Right. Well, yeah. Especially, mm-hmm. you know, if you're, you know, the type of person who isn't going to just be quiet mm-hmm. and, you know, Operation Light Shine, it grew extremely fast. And that was yeah. you. You know, you put that team together. Um, and of course, Jim as well. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's you and Jim. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, you built it really fast. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you have an organization, let's say like the Tebow Foundation that wants to keep everything PC, yeah, uh, that's okay. I that's mean, I, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm-hmm. But I couldn't operate under, you know, that type of no. environment either because you're being muzzled. Mm-hmm. You're not, yeah. you know, you're not speaking out. And there, there's times where when it is okay to, to not speak out on certain issues. Like yeah. we're talking about certain things on some of the podcasts i'm like ah, oh, gosh you know the mob's mm-hmm. crazy and what are they gonna you know is it, is it worth it and i think that's logical and reasonable but you know it should be your choice and not uh, an organization yeah. that's funding your nonprofit to where you're um you have to do what they say 100 percent. And, and here's the thing man i have all the love and respect for for tim tebow in the world i think he's an amazing human being uh i hope to have the impact on, on the world and, and people that, that he's had you know, um, I don't try to be like him. I just, sure. you know, I just want to have that impact, you know, and, but Tim has to operate differently. I mean, let's be honest, Tim's probably attacked, you know, more for being a Christian who stood his ground and the things, you know, Tim's picked his battles. He's fought mm-hmm. his battles and, and he stood by what he believes in. Uh, but I also am my own man and, and I have to pave my own way. So it wasn't that Tim and I parted ways, so so to speak. You know, I just wanted to do things in a way where if who I am as a man and, you know, what I believe in, what I stand for did not negatively, if, you know, drag Tim into something, right? That's, you know, he's going to pick what battles he wants to fight, and I'm going to do that too, right? Um, forever grateful for the money and the help that he's given me. And, um, you know, he'll always be a friend and, you know, you know uh, always uh, help him out or hopefully he helps me out when, whenever we need it. But, you know, at least publicly standing next to each other at a press conference on stage. And, you know, there's, there's probably time for us to, you know, go go our separate ways in that capacity. right? So, so T- you never had yeah. shots with Tebow? What's that? No, no, I actually <laughs> never, he, he never drank, man. And, you know, uh, the, the thing that I respect the most about him, I'll say this is, you know, a lot of people say a lot of shit, right? Mm-hmm. And then uh, you find out there are different people yeah. behind closed doors. Uh, Tim practices what he preaches. Yeah, he know? seems like a great guy. I mean, he, seems he really like is. He's, he seems like uh, mm-hmm. someone who's honest and he has, you know, yeah, he, he, he does, mm-hmm. uh, he walks the walk. He does. He does, man. 
And, you know, here, here's the thing, like, you know, not to go on a tangent, but I'm a Christian. I believe in God, and it's been a journey. It's been a process. I found God again, you know, after losing my sister. You know, I turned away from him for a while because, I mean, you know, I'm not saying really in special forces, but other things I've done in my career. You kind of become the devil, you know, and um, to fight the devil, if that makes sense, you know. Uh, so I questioned a lot, uh, but now I'm using everything that they turned me into and made me do for good. You know, that's the way I look at it, and I'm trying to figure out how to become a better Christian, but... You know, people are like, oh, Matt, you cuss, or Matt, you drink, or, you know, you've done some dumb stuff. Man, I've done a lot of dumb stuff, you know. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> brother, you know, here's the thing. I'm not trying to be a saint, you know, but I'm trying to do good for others, right? You know, don't worry about what I do to myself. I'm working on me, you know, every day. I'm trying to be better. I'm trying to be a good husband, you know, and trying. we just got married a couple weeks ago, yeah. you know, I'm... You know, I'm trying to be a better person, but I'm always going to be rough around the edges. I'm always going to be that kid that grew up in the hood in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm always going to have a little bit of that special forces guy in me. I'm always going to have, you know, that's going to be the driver. And that's what makes me good at what I do and able to do things that other people can't. Right. You know, because I've danced with the devil. A lot of people have don't even know what he is and are scared to say, fuck, I'll say fuck all day. <laughs> you, you know, and, you know, you might want to edit that out. No, but, you know, anymore. but my, my point is, man, is you have so many people out there that are Christians that project their version of Christianity yeah. or how they believe you should be on others. Right. I don't see anywhere in the Bible that says don't say fuck. You know, what I do see in the Bible is like, live like Jesus, right? Do good for others. You know, so I'm trying to be, and I'm trying to do good for others. I live my life for others now, yeah. for, for innocent children, right? And, but and I see that in Tim. Tim has a different way of doing that, you know? More power to him, all respect in the world. It's just not me. Yeah. You know? No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah it's, it's uh, uh, different styles, and doesn't mean one is, is better, you know, mm -hmm. than the other. Um, he just has probably better blood, you know, blood sugar and lower cholesterol than I do. Right. He's probably a little healthier. His liver enzymes are down. Uh, no, 100%. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I guess you, you went to, mm -hmm. to Sentinel and, mm -hmm. uh, what's, what's that been like? Man, it, it has been an amazing ride, you know? Um, so the first part of what Sentinel does is overseas operations, you know, so they take some of the best people America has to offer, you know, from Delta force and the special operations community, from the intel community, you know, hackers, intel analysts, OSINT investigators, human human intelligence people, puts them together and accomplishes missions overseas, right? Uh, so, you know, I am the president of what happens here in the U.S., and there's a big build-out that I'm working on right now. I can't really give details on that uh, just for, you know, OPSEC reasons, but we uh, have been able to accomplish the foundation a lot overseas, you know, in the, in the past year. Uh, rescuing kids in multiple different countries from Uganda to Thailand. Uh, but just recently, uh, Glenn and the, uh, the Intel team were able to get uh, 65 Americans, you know, out of uh, Gaza, Palestine area and, and out to safety uh, with the help of some centers, Mark Mullen and then um, uh, Lindsey Graham, you know, so there, there was a pretty big effort that they just got back from to get those people rescued and, and that's what Sentinel does, man, from Afghanistan to Ukraine to, to now Israel when there's humanitarian crisis to Haiti. They, they accomplish missions and things that other organizations can't, you know, because it's a, it's a collection of some of the best people America has to offer that were, you know, um, tri trained by fire in the global war on terror. Sure. Right? Um, also, too, you know, the counter-trafficking and exploitation missions, and, and now we've got a pretty big build-out uh, for what we're about to do here in the States really excited about, you know, um, what can you tell yeah. us? Well, basically what I can say is this, um, operation light shine for me, I would say I'd never ran an NGO before obviously, mm -hmm. <laughs> or started one. Uh, and I had never worked with law enforcement before. And, you know, basically every mistake that I made at light shine and everything that I am still my fault that I allowed to happen at light shine that I could have stopped, um, I have now created a model that I believe is a lot better and is being very well received by a lot of states right now. So basically putting the ball back in the state's hands, they should be paying for this, not donors. Donors should be adding scale, value, capability, but the nuts and bolts of moving pieces, the law enforcement salaries, the task force creation, all that stuff that needs to be paid for by the state. You know, that's, we pay taxes. That's the state's responsibilities. Donors are supposed to, make, you know, in, in my mind, an NGO is supposed to make what 
the state has as far as taking care of women and children and people in need better. But the state should be funding the, the core stuff of that program, which in my mind is law enforcement salaries, which in my mind is their overtime, is their vehicles, is dictating the creation of these task forces. We have task forces to fight drugs. We have task forces to fight guns. We have task forces to fight organized crime all over this country. When right now our children are literally in more vulnerable and at more risk than children have ever been in human history mm -hmm. because of the internet. And we are in and headed towards the, who knows where the ceiling for this is the largest public health crisis in human history because of trafficking and child, especially child exploitation. And we don't have a task force, nothing dictated by the government to fight it. $40 billion a year is spent by the federal government to fight the war on drugs. $40 billion. Mm. I could buy a dime bag probably in this neighborhood, probably at a neighbor's house if I wanted to, right? Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. Drugs are everywhere. Yep. Not only are they everywhere, they're legal in some places and, and part of a culture that they're never going to stop, mm -hmm. right? $40 billion is still spent to fight that. We have an entire government agency established to fight it, yet drugs are everywhere and more people are dying from fentanyl than the Vietnam War. We have, we have drug epidemics at, you know, epic proportions right now compared to where they've been. Mm -hmm. And our children who are being victimized in ways that I can't even put a number to right now because ISPs and big tech hides it. Um, we do know we're in the largest public health crisis ever because of what's happening to our kids from depression, suicide, all of the sexual hypersexualization and things that are happening to them online. And excuse me. Our government spends two hundred million federal a year mm. to fight this, and big tech spends more money than that to lobby against fighting it. So right? big, oh, big tech is lobbying against uh, oh, yeah. fighting human trafficking. Well, but, but child exploitation, child the most, exploitation. or self disclosing. Because think about this: if you're Mark Zuckerberg and own Facebook, or you know whatever Chinese uh, asshole owns TikTok. And then you've got Snapchat, and Roblox, and all these video games and a ton of platforms that children are on, encouraged to be on, and to use. Where do you think the predators are? They're on there, right? And if you're one of those service providers and a child is victimized on your service and you did nothing, you were complicit in it, you're part of that lawsuit. Mm. The amount of child exploitation that happens on all of these platforms, all these games, and, and you know, social media and everything else that's out there would literally crumble tech. The lawsuits would devour them. Mm. If it was made public, what's happening, and they were allowed to be, you know, culpable, you know, in these lawsuits, you know, the restitution for these families. So they spend millions of dollars to protect your privacy, right? To mm -hmm. protect your data. Well, what they're really doing is making sure they don't get sued into non-existence, but most importantly now, data is worth more than oil. Yeah. So what they're doing really is protecting and controlling the collection of data on you and their little bubble trying to know, learn as much because you know there's a matt murphy box there's an ed clay box everyone who's watching this they have a little box at every single company where they have an account and all they do is collect data about them and then they sell it right so it's all about the bottom line it's about they put profit over our children profit over our children's mental health and god knows what that means for our future uh, so what I'm trying to do now is like we talked about earlier, light shine, it was expensive. It works. It's, it's an effective model to an extent. There's, there were next levels that you have to get to with the Intel work, with the technology and, and with the support and especially legislative changes that need to be made, which I'm working on some of that. I can't talk about that either, but just, you know, NDAs and stuff, but there are, so many things that need to be done on top of just law enforcement saving kids, prevention, awareness, education, and, and most importantly, a much bigger net that can be cast, you know, to, to get these predators and, and bring them in. So I took all the lessons learned at Lightshine, all the mistakes, all the failures, all the stupid stuff that I did, and, and even things I didn't know better about. And then, you know, how the model kind of went, things that I would change, and I'm, I've brought that to Sentinel, and I think we've built something that you know, puts most of the um, burden on the state where it should be anyways mm -hmm. with our tax money. And then we can enhance capabilities with, with donor money and then really start to get after uh, these pedophiles and these predators that are after our children. Oh, that's 
That's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, how big of a problem is child trafficking in the United States? I mean, I, I've seen a bunch of different statistics, a yeah. bunch of different numbers. What do you really think it is? So here's, I don't want to go around to answer that question, but you kind of have to. It's really hard to put data against child trafficking, right? Because one, it's not properly investigated. And there's really, you know, let's let's say in every region of every state where the federal government is, there might be two or three officers that work trafficking, but they work five other things as well, right, on the federal side. Local side, they don't have enough money for that. The taxpayers are complaining about car break-ins, robberies, rapes, drugs, gangs, you see where murders, all mm -hmm. that. See where I'm going with that? So there's really not a whole lot of emphasis. Actually, here in Nashville, love our city council, they disbanded the human trafficking department of the Nashville Police Department this past year. Why? Because well, there's no data to show that it's a problem, right? Even really? though we know it is, right? Wait, so the mm -hmm. Nashville Metro Council yeah. disbanded the human trafficking department yeah. for the police? Yep. Yeah, there were about uh, eight to 10 officers in Nashville that worked human trafficking. How many arrests they were, were they getting? Uh, I don't know the arrest numbers, but but that's a problem. They don't have the adequate resources to investigate it in the first place. I mean, you're putting, no offense, law enforcement officers that have you know very little training outside of the police academy, and definitely no t training in tech, limited resources and throwing them against organized crime. I mean, who do you think is going to win? Organized crime right now is more technologically advanced than our own government. There's seven to eight backstops in the cartel for everything. Wait, wait. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is... Mm -hmm. that the Nashville Metro Council mm -hmm. defunded the... Disbanded. Disbanded mm -hmm. the uh, Nashville Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force in the police department. Inside the Metro PD. Inside the Metro mm -hmm. Police Department. Yep. And then they cut funding mm -hmm. uh, to that. And by doing that, uh, Operation Light Shiner Nashville died. Uh, died. Yeah. So the, the only way that Light Shine in Nashville would have survived was the, the human trafficking task force we built. Now, granted, law enforcement all over the state fought against it. It was the most unbelievable thing I've ever heard. You know, people were trying to call me the next Tim Ballard or, you know, some special forces, whatever. Law enforcement in the state of Tennessee, and I don't mind saying it now, has been one of the most frustrating law enforcement I've ever had to deal with in my life. It's all about this is mine. It's all about a pride thing. I had somebody at um, TBI go to war with me just bad mouthing me all over the state because he had been burned by a charity before. Um, you know, because they, he had been, did he get burned by your charity? No, somebody no. else's. And, and he just decided that he hated me. Wow. Um, what are, what are, what did he say about it? Like what's the, uh, it all started with a post on, on Facebook. Uh -huh. I made a post and, and it had a picture. There you go posting stuff. Uh, no, I know. Right. Here we go again. <laughs> but no, I mean, people don't read. Uh, it had a bullet. Mm -hmm. And it said the cure for pedophilia on the bullet. Oh. That was a picture. But in the caption, I wrote a very eloquent, hey, you know, as much as the father, the brother, the special operations guy in me wishes this was the answer, mm -hmm. here in the States, we have constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. We have a judicial system and everybody deserves due process of the law. And I was like, as much as we believe that this is a cure, the real cure is giving law enforcement the resources that they need, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to fight against, you know, this ever-growing crime. Sure. Um, anyways, long story short, the cop didn't read the caption. He looked at the picture, and he's like, oh, he's another one of these, you know, special operations a-holes that's going to, you know, uh, get us all in trouble and do vigilante stuff. Mm. Not the case at all, man. Uh, but unfortunately, Tennessee's loss is now Florida's gain. The task forces in Florida are crushing it right now. Uh, the sheriffs have gotten fully behind it in the regions that they're in, and they're saving kids left and right. Yeah. Uh, but Tennessee decided to destroy that in their inf infinite wisdom. Uh, you know, it, it's sad. It's sad to see uh, what happened. But the city council was the reason for that. The chief of police, and I, I got to find the memo. So not Tennessee, Davidson County, Nashville. Davidson that, County. That, that, that. Yeah, but there was other issues, you know, around Tennessee. TBI would never join it. Um, you know, but in other states, state, federal, local, all joining it. Uh, TBI was a huge issue here. They, they fought against it really hard. It was a pride thing. Mm. And what I wanted to work together. We were all just trying to put resources together to save kids, and they wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, so anyways, um, we had uh, an issue with the city council because when they canceled that human trafficking department division inside of Metro PD, 
then the officers that Chief Drake was going to send onto the Lightshine Task Force couldn't come. Right? And then they started making up some other nonsense about, like, security and the building. And it's it just basically everyone threw every issue they possibly could yeah. into it and said, what do we have to do to save children? Mm-hmm. What can we do to get ahead of this problem? Mm-hmm. Everybody wanted to, you know, be a bureaucrat or a politician or a problem, mm-hmm. you know, here in Tennessee. We haven't experienced that in other states we've gone into, which is just sad. This is my home state. This is, you know, where I live. And it, and it got destroyed by that. So once they got rid of that um Task Force of Metro, Chief Drake couldn't give the officers, you know, from the Metro PD. And then that ended up having us to close shop, you know, here in Nashville with the task force for the for middle of the state. I hate to see that it, that it died. And, you know, I, I was, was I Chief Drake back. supportive of the task oh, force. Agree. Yeah, he wrote a memo and it got published in the paper. Um, you know, you can Google it, you know, yeah. where he said he's going to put officers on the intercept task force. But the city council. And their infinite wisdom uh, put a stop to that. Wow. Mm-hmm. And what did the city council say? Did you hear anything from the Metro Man, Council? I, you know, in my limited interaction with the city council, uh, I didn't even go bark up that tree because I think at that time they were more worried about arguing about pronouns wow. and uh, inclusion and the proper ways to address you know, all 1,000 of them in a meeting. <laughs> you know, um, this, our city council is might as well. Um, yeah, they're... They're it's getting just... shrunk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they're cutting well, it in, what, in half, right? Well, I think they stopped that last I heard, right? Mm, I'm not sure. No, no. They'll find a way to stop it. I don't know. It's yeah. going to be hard to stop. I mean, the, the state's mm. over the, the yeah. it's over all that. Man, I hope so. Our, our state needs to come in here and, and clean house in Nashville. We've, we've, gone, we've gone a bad direction. Well, I mean, you know? the, the thing about Davidson County, I mean, the surrounding counties are, are more logical. Mm-hmm. Uh, Davidson County, you know, you have these activist council people Yeah, that, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're on the Metro Council, I, I appreciate those mm-hmm. that have full-time jobs and are, you know, working 50, 60 hours a week and can be a council person. Yes. But, you know, someone like me, I would have to quit my job mm-hmm. to be a council person and do that type of stuff. So, you know, we don't really al- uh, al- align and yeah. a lot of those people, they don't like business owners. They don't like, you know, anybody who uh, I, I would call it as a, as a masculine man. That's yeah. offensive to them. And so you have all these very, very weak policies. You have people that get really loud and that are activists and that virtue signal, but they don't really have good arguments when you go to debate them. Yeah, They're very boisterous. They're very judgmental mm-hmm. as in, you know, uh, how how virtuous and and grand their ideas are, but not very open to finding you know common ground because there's probably not a lot of common ground in the end because they refuse to yeah. to budge an inch. I don't I don't think you know the the problem is man is you know and this is a country America problem. I mean most of the Western world problem now we are so politically polarized. And you know we could go on for days about the reasons for that from you know media to you know, propaganda, the psychological warfare that's going on in this country, the broken education system. I mean, our colleges have pretty much become, you know, farming grounds for, you know, radicalization. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, hell, our, our colleges are supporting Hamas right now. Yeah, well, you supporting, don't support Hamas? I uh, mean, you know, I have never really <laughs> been a big fan of people that, you know, murder innocent men, women, and children and, you know, uh, behead and rape women and babies and, and laugh about it on camera. But I've never been but a fan of that. doesn't Israel kill innocent people? Well, you know, I, I I hate to say it like this, but people, these idiots that are speaking out against it, they don't understand how war works. Right. You know, um, Hamas was the aggressor. You know, Palestine, you know, people need a history lesson, I think, on this. Palestine is not a real state, right? It's It's a territory that was granted, you know, the 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 area they're basically nomads and and unwanted people from you know Western Asia and other Arab nations that all came together and started saying they're Palestinians in the old area of Palestine, which is part of Israel, which mm-hmm. you go all the way back to the Bible on. Um, they I think 1986 or 88, one of those two, been blown up a lot. So exact numbers are tough for me sometimes, but uh, they were granted you know this Palestine state right uh, then before that. It just was a, it was no man's land, mm-hmm. right? And and then all of traditionally, biblically, part of Israel. It had been handed over from 
God, from the Christians to the Muslims to, you know, God knows who since, you know, the beginning of, you know, written time. So um, all these people that, you know, what what's really happening in the Middle East is this, is the Quran has two parts. There is the part where Muhammad's at war, the wartime version of the Quran, and then there's the peacetime mm-hmm. version of the Quran. And those are two completely different scriptures and two completely different Muhammads, right? But as a devout Muslim, you know, they're both right. You know, so the problem with the wartime part of the Quran is that it's the caliphate needs to be established, this this Muslim ruled you know area, the old than what ISIS tried to do essentially. Um, and in order to do that, you have to murder the Christians and the Jews. You gotta get rid of them. And if they do not get murdered and they choose, it says this in the Quran, you can look it up, they choose to be able to be in this area, the Muslims allow it, they must be less than and pay taxes. Mm. Right. So so killing and beheading and, and raping and treating, you know, Christian and Jewish women and men as lesser than as slaves is not just, you know, something terrorists think. It's, mm-hmm. it's Islam. Yeah. Right? And, you know, it, what the big difference to me is, mm-hmm. you know, Israel isn't publicly saying that they want to kill innocent people or publicly, mm-hmm. uh, you know, acknowledging mm-hmm. that we intentionally killed innocent yeah. people. If they do, it's collateral damage. If they do, 100%. it's Hamas putting stockpiling their weapons underneath the hospitals. Well, terrorists are cowards, right? Well, yeah, yeah. absolutely. But, I mean, but that Israel's not doing that, and right. yeah, that's the big difference to me. It's mm-hmm. like, well, what about isn't Israel killing innocent people? Yeah, yeah, of course, it's collateral damage, and it's sad every single time. But they're not doing it intentionally. They're not like targeting well, civilians just to kill them 100 percent. well here's the and this while i was going on that little tangent is this is the problem so in in the middle east now you have a lot of countries that have come extremely mega wealthy off of natural gas and oil right look at dubai uae oh you in dubai and uae qatar you know uh look at saudi arabia i mean you have a lot of nations that have prospered and thrived and you know have billions and trillions of dollars yeah you know from oil now, those are the peaceful, happy, fat Muslims, right? What are, they don't want conflict. They don't sure. want war. They want their yachts, their nice homes, and the Lamborghinis. And, you know, they want wives. nothing to do with some jihad. Yeah, a bunch of hot wives, right? <laughs> Mostly from Russia. Or maybe that's the concubines. But I, I mean, and I, I can say this. I'm not just talking out of my ass. I lived in the Middle East for almost 20 years. Yeah, you speak, speak Arabic. Too. speak Arabic fluently in two dialects. I've lived in almost every country. I have friends of every flavor of Islam, you know, and I have this conversation openly with it. They'll agree with you. They won't say it publicly, but they'll agree with you behind closed doors. It's fault. But the problem is, is that the Muslims in these wealthy countries that have more money than they know what to do with, I mean, they have Lamborghini cop cars, for heaven's sakes, mm-hmm. they send all this money to the poor. Muslim nations like Lebanon, Palestine, you know, uh, I mean, even Iran does it. Iran sends mm-hmm. money in too. Syria, they create and they fund these terrorist organizations. So Hezbollah doesn't shit where they sleep. They're an Iranian terrorist group, but they occupy Lebanon. You know, ISIS doesn't shit where they sleep. They're a terrorist group that's funded by Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, but they occupy Syria, right? Um, and, and that's where all of this it gets insane. So you have these wealthy companies feeding money, feeding weapons, ammunition, and then feeding hate and accomplishing half the goals of the Quran through the poor people who just get radicalized Muhammad Jihad, you know, kind of like teen America movie, you know? Yeah. Um, huh. but man, it, and that's what's sad. So you have the poor Muslims who have nothing, Right seeing the woe is me card instead of, you know, trying to make their life better, they turn how bad their life is instead of blaming it on a a situation or Mm -hmm. their own doing, they always blame it on the Jews or blame it on the Christians. And it's kept them in this constant state of civil war, faction on faction, tribe on tribe, sect on sect. And then when they occasionally want to get froggy enough, uh, you know, attack on Israel or attack on America, uh, and that's the world that we're living in now. So until the wealthy Muslims stop funding, and, and let's be honest, some, we do some BS there too, but I'm going to go into that. Uh, until the wealthy Muslims stop taking advantage of the poverty and the, and the situation of the poor Muslims, we're, we're never going to see the end of this. Did you say that Saudi Arabia mm-hmm. and uh, Turkey fund ISIS? Oh, yeah. 
Really? Very well known. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a lot I could say on that. Uh, you can give a Google on some um, situations, yeah. but you know, these countries speak out of two sides of their mouth, sure. you know, because overtly government side, they'll work with the U S we have bases in Turkey. You know, we work, we, we get along for the most part with Saudi Arabia, but then the wealthy Royal families of families that control the country, the military, they funnel money into these terrorist groups. It's insane. What benefit did the, the Saudi Arabia have mm -hmm. by, uh, funding ISIS? Well, if you if you look at it like this, they are still accomplishing the the goals of Islam. Okay. But they're not having to do the dirty work. Mm. You know, the rich man's always paid the poor man to do his dirty work for him, to fight his wars, excuse me, to do everything that's necessary. So that's really what you're seeing is you're seeing these countries um, funding terrorism quietly, discreetly. I mean, the, the Taliban has an embassy in Qatar. Interesting. Where, where the wealthy members of the Taliban who you know, take the money and then funnel bits and pieces back in to Afghanistan, you know, drive nice cars, live in nice houses, eat good food and yeah. the nice fat and, you know, sleep with prostitutes in the ho parts of the hotel where only men are allowed, you know, the usual, you know, um, Islam thing. Who, who's the new, uh, I don't know if he's king yet, uh, but uh, of Saudi Arabia, that's, um, what's his name? Oh, I don't remember. Yeah. He's, uh, he's a young guy. Yeah. But, um, yeah, let's see. Let's see his, his name real quick. Yeah, it's not Solomon. It's the uh, no. He's M. He's on his way out. Mohammed bin Salman. Yeah. So you have the yeah. the guy that's basically in charge now. He's a young guy. Mm -hmm. uh, looks to be like 30, 38 years old. Yeah. Probably, um, probably went to Western schools. Yeah. <clears throat> um, he's been doing some interesting things. Obviously, like Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. is is coming up right now. They're, they they seem to be. Uh, trying to to get more modern per se, they are, um, and uh, you know, but but you're saying that they have a specific, they're trying to fund the caliphate. Yeah, well, I mean, look. So what you're what you see in here is, you know, they these there's princes for days, there's mm -hmm. wealthy Saudi Arabians for days, tons of families, offshoots of a royal family that control all kinds of companies and oil. Sure. Their, you know, their money goes towards this extremism. A lot of it does. Interesting. You know, so, I mean, think about it like this. Palestine is a little shithole, no exports, no oil, nothing, and yet has billionaires that are in charge of a mosque, right? And it's what seems to be an unlimited supply of rockets, bullets, guns, technology, you know, all kinds of different weapons, tunnels throughout the entire country. I mean, they're they're not. Where's that money coming from? It's not coming from Palestine. Well, I thought you know mm -hmm. probably Iran. Uh, no, Iran. Iran mainly gets into Hezbollah. They support Hamas too, but every country has their own little terrorist group. Hezbollah is Iran's baby. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, Abu Dhabi seems pretty cool. Those yeah. guys in, in Abu Dhabi actually. Uh, I mean. I, I didn't know that Saudi Arabia was funding. Uh, it's not the country. It's the people that are in power I see. in the country that are part of these, you know, royal families, and I these, see. Big, these big groups. It's I not see. the so government. It's not necessarily even the even government that guy. overtly. It's not it, even necessarily the new king. Yeah. The but, guys you know, no one's stopping it. Prince. No one, you know, yeah. they, they could very well stop it. They, and that's the problem, man. And I've got a lot of Muslim friends from princes on, on the way down, man. I'm going to just say it, tell the truth, because if you don't tell the truth and nothing ever changes, is they, they're all good people, right? But they, there's not really a lot of people doing anything to stop it. I see. Right? And, and that's the issue here. Yeah, so it's just mm -hmm. kind of allowing it to happen is, yeah. is the problem. Turn the other cheek, look the other way, because the problem with Islam is, you know, you can't speak out against it because it is in the Quran, just as much as the peaceful life that you want to live is in the Quran. It's a very... Just like people say the Old and New Testament, you uh -huh. go from, you know, in the Bible, eye for an eye, mm -hmm. kind of, you know, let, let's go to war kind of God. Let, let me burn cities to the ground and flood the world and kill us all kind of God. Sure. Then you go to, you know, Jesus, which is offering forgiveness and salvation. All you have to do is accept him, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the Bible, God in the, in the Bible changes tones a, lo a lot. In Islam, it's much more drastic. But the difference in the Bible and the Quran is this. The Quran gives man the ability to carry out God's judgment and tells man to carry out God's judgment. If you're gay, you're thrown off a roof. I forget how many stories high. Just tossed, right? Yeah. But 
in the Bible, it says it's a sin. Mm-hmm. No, it doesn't say, you know, kill them. It just says God will judge, right? And Jesus forgives. You know, so that is the danger in the Quran is anything's justifiable. Now, I, I have got to look this up again. This is not a joke, uh, by the way. But there was a uh, sheikh, I forget what country he's from, he's got a pretty famous, like, call-in show. And this just shows you the hypocrisy, you know, or the level of hypocrisy that you can have in, in religion in general, but it is specifically Islam. And this guy calls in, he goes, hey, you know, I want to know if it's okay for my friends to repeatedly rape me in the ass, right? The reason is, is because I want to make my anal cavity bigger. This is not a joke, by the way, so that I can put more explosives in there and then carry out a suicide attack. So... They're telling me that, you know, they need to have sex with me over and over and over again so to expand it to make it easier to fit more explosives in there. He calls into the sheikh and asks him. The sheikh says, I love this, um, you know, uh, anal sex, sex with men is haram, forbidden, but jihad is the ultimate, you know, uh, ultimate sacrifice, ultimate thing that you can do for God. I'm not saying exactly right because it's translated. So if you indeed are letting men have sex with you in the ass to put more explosives in, to carry out jihad, to kill infidels, then it will be forgiven. Wow. You know, so, and that's the problem with a lot of religions, not just Islam, right? It is I believe in God, not a, not a religious doctrine, you know, it's created. And, um, you know, the problem is, is man can utilize and has always utilized religion to justify some of those heinous, horrendous things. And yeah, no, a- absolutely. And yeah, Christianity, I mean, has <laughs> done a lot of bad stuff. I mean, 100%. even what you're seeing right now with the Catholic Church, you know, a lot of the pedophilia coming out, um, oh, man. You know, the suggestions that, you know, is the Roman Catholic Church, uh, you know, secretly a, a pedophile organization? Man, you know, that's a tough one because you're seeing... Thousands of priests. It's lots of evidence. And I'll, mm-hmm. I'll say this. Yeah. You know, the, the, the trans movement, as much as I dislike how they're mm-hmm. throwing it in our face and how mm-hmm. uh, they they say that you're transphobic if you don't want a biological man competing in women's sports, for instance. Yeah. Um, there haven't been a lot of trans people arrested in the last year for pedophilia. That's true. I was actually, uh, I was looking at it a, a few weeks ago. I think there was like one or two. Yeah, you know, and you're only talking about. Uh, I think there was like four drag queens. It, it wasn't a giant. It, w- it wasn't the amount that uh, the, the people are suggesting. But you know, you mm-hmm. look at Sunday school teachers, preachers, um, uh, priests. It's a lot. Yeah, it is. Well, man, I mean, there's there's a couple issues for that, and I think the it's important to understand. Um, if you're a pedophile, right? Like, so backtrack it a little bit. There's been some studies, um, legitimate and nefarious studies done by our government and, and medicine. And, and your sexuality, your, your need to, you know, have sex, really biological need to reproduce is at the, you know, really the, the base of all of your decisions, you know, how you live your life and everything that you do. Right. Um, now, I don't think anyone knows what makes somebody a pedophile, whether it's abuse as a child or just some, you know, um, something gone wrong in the development of the brain. I'm not even going to speak on that because no one knows. But here nor there, these people are attracted to and will do anything to have sex with, with a minor, right? So if you're going to do that, you have to put yourselves in position where you have access to what you sexually crave. So... You know, pedophiles traditionally have been more attracted to being Sunday school teachers, pastors, you know, teachers, soccer coaches, um, you know, even befriended families and gotten very close with families just so they could access to have access to the children. You know, they put themselves if you're a pedophile and, you know, you work at, um, let's say, you know, some corporate job, you're setting yourself up for failure, so to speak, because you're not doing anything to get yourself close to kids. If you become a Sunday school teacher, you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're living the dream. You're surrounded by children all the time, right? You know, I I hate to look at it like that, but that's just the reality. Pedophiles put themselves close to, to the danger. 
Yeah, and, and uh, you know, Warren, I'm going to send you something real quick, and mm -hmm. I want you to watch this. Uh, I want you, to, if you can post this up. A conspiracy by a far-right Christian group that seems to be causing a lot of the problem. This is week 33 of Who's Making News for Sex Crimes Involving Children? And in a week in which 11 more pastors, four more Catholic priests, a Mormon bishop, and three additional church employees all made the news, out in Wisconsin, a nonpartisan, nonprofit group called Wisconsin Watch exposed what it describes as a far right Christian lobbying group, which calls itself the Family Policy Alliance, an affiliate of a ministry that calls itself the Family Policy Council. Now, these are organizations pushing template based legislation they call help, not harm. The problem, these groups are offering intentional falsehoods, not shading, not spinning, just lying to prop up those bills. And Republican legislators have been eating it up, passing laws based on the right-wing disinformation in 20 states so far. So let's get to the facts. It's the religious industry employees who are comprising almost 11% of the now 3,300 plus people who've made the news for sexual assaults on children since February. That's 361 of 3,306 cases this year in the United States. This week, we've also added two more politicians. One's a Democrat, the other in a heavily Republican district, but the election itself was listed as nonpartisan. Republicans comprise 81% of the 43 politicians who have made news. Not one drag queen has made the news since we started tracking, and three transgender people who represent less than one-tenth of one percent of the cases. The data shows a child is more likely to be struck by lightning, 837 times more likely to be sexually assaulted by a religion industry employee than a transgender person. 115 times more likely to be assaulted by a politician. So as the far right continues to spread its bile and to seek to impose its religion on the rest of us, here's what you can do. Head on over to whoismakingnews.com, download the data, sort it whatever way you like, and shove the verifiable facts right down the throat of the next Republican or right-wing theologian who starts in on, oh, it's transgender people and drag queens who are a danger to your children, because they're not. She has a good point. She, yeah, I mean, yeah. it was, I, I found that, uh, I found that interesting, because yeah. she, she does make some good points. She makes mm -hmm. some, uh, some really good points. And, um, you know, you think about, <clears throat> there is a lot of focus on the, the trans and the, and the drag queens. And mm -hmm. I think there's, there's two sections. One, uh, you know, there's the, we see the mainstream media, et cetera, the public schools, uh, in a way, sexualizing, uh, the children mm -hmm. and giving them things, uh, giving them information before a lot of us think that they, they should, or giving it in a way that we don't agree with. And they're, they're mm -hmm. presenting it as fact Yep, that I don't like, but you know, the other one is the undertone that, you know, the trans movement are groomers and pedophiles and those type of things. And, you know, if those, mm -hmm. those statistics are true, if that data is true, it doesn't really seem to be the case. Yeah. Oh, well, you're right. Uh, here, here's where I think we have taken a serious, uh, a very serious misstep as, as a, a country. We have changed uh, identifying the issues with humans and, and just people in general and turned everything into identity politics, right? You're, you're no longer a person. You're a Christian. You're a Muslim. You're a Jew. You're a Democrat. You're a Republican. You're gay. You're trans. Like we, we, we label first and then, and then we blame, oh, well, this label did this much of this. This label did this much of this. What, what I like to look at it is um, we're all humans. Human nature, we're flawed. Yeah. You know, everything around us seems to be evolving because of technology and artificial intelligence and, you know, science and all these capabilities. Um, but what we've done is we've given people the power to 
you know, control your mind because, because of, you know, social media and everything else. So now instead of saying, hey, humans have not evolved, we have not changed, human nature has not changed, we're still the same idiots, mm -hmm. you know, as we're, you know, beating each other to death with sticks and stones, who knows how many thousands of years ago, you know, we have not seen the uh, evolution in humanity, right? Mm -hmm. We've seen evolution in everything around us that can control us, that can manipulate us, that can lead us, steer us, but not us, right? So to say that one, because we haven't changed, we are vulnerable to all of these things, uh, and we all make mistakes and have issues and have problems, uh, and that, you know, some of them obviously worse than others, right? You can be an alcoholic or a pedophile, part, part, part of that humanity chain of dysfunction, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but what is happening is, is we have said certain things are acceptable and certain things are not, and then they'll never change, like murder, right? Murder will never be acceptable. Mm -hmm. Pedophilia, uh, sexually harming a child will never be acceptable. Right. But what we've started to do, because we play identity politics now, is we wrap up issues, evil things. Mm -hmm. in, in my mind, I don't have anything against trans people. Right? Let me let me start off with this. I don't have anything against gay people. I have gay friends. I've got a friend that dresses up like a girl. I don't think he's cut off his dick off yet. I like him as a person. Do I agree with his choices? I don't necessarily approve or agree with it, but I'm not going to you know, cast him away because of his differences. I got my shit too. <laughs> we all do, right? Yeah. What I have a problem with is how we are attacking the innocence and sanctity of childhood. That's where I draw the line. Don't fuck with kids, right? Let children be children. Let them grow up in, in the innocent. Let them learn. Let them start to, based on their age and their maturity, really their maturity start to deal with new concept and grasp new things, that kid will know whether it's, you know, gay or straight. That kid will figure out all these things. It doesn't need to be force-fed things before they're mature enough or they're old enough to make decisions, right? But adults, in our infinite wisdom, are encroaching on the sanctity of childhood and doing things and putting things in front of children that, in, in my mind, I can't find in history that we've allowed to happen. Mm -hmm. We've never allowed children to be victimized like this but before they were mature. It's, it's textbook grooming, manipulation, and extortion that's happening to our children at the cost of the identity politics of adults. Yeah. All right? So in my mind, like the trans movement, if you're an adult and you want to cut your dick off, I don't agree with you. I think it's a horrible idea. But I'm not going to stop you from doing it. Right? I'm not, I'm not going to get in your way. I'm not, I'm not a far-right guy. I'm kind of a centric you know, I have some conservative views. I have some liberal views, but don't fuck with kids. But we're we're taking identity politics. We're taking our adult agendas, the justification of our existences and our identities that we've been forced to or programmed to to you know let rule our lives, whether we're gay, we're trans, we're Republican, conservative, liberal, democratic. We let that rule our decision makings, rule our thoughts. We no longer think individually. We yeah. no longer use logic and reason. So we allow someone to say, hey, this kid wants to cut his dick off. You know, go for right. it, buddy. You know, because we're justifying our identity. We've we fucked up. We have gone down the wrong path yeah. as people. And the problem is people like I know we agree on a lot of things. We talk through a lot of stuff. We don't yeah. always agree on everything, yeah. but we talk through things and, and, and we respect each other. Right. I respect you as a human being. Absolutely. I respect what you're doing. And I don't want you to agree with everything that I agree in, because you know what? Then I know you're just full of shit. You're right. lying to me about it. Right. <laughs> I like the fact that we can say, I'm at, you know, I don't, I don't look at it like that. But the issue here is, is that most of society can't be like us anymore. Right. Most of society don't realize how mind controlled, how they've been put in a little bit of box where if you're a liberal, you now have to agree with everything in this liberal doctrine. No matter how insane it gets, you can't go against the group. It's almost become a religion, yes. right? And remember we talked about how dangerous a religion is? Politics has almost become religion. All these identity uh, boxes that we've been put, that we have to fit into and act like everyone else in them, no matter what's thrown in the box for us to accept or digest or approve of next, we have to agree with. And if we keep down this path, we're fucked. Yeah. No, it, it does feel like it's a religion. You know, mm -hmm. currently, uh, science feels like a religion too, actually. Oh. It's like science is almost replacing God um, mm -hmm. in many ways. Actually, science is replacing God 
in many ways. But is it science anymore? No. Well, no. Yeah. And that's a whole other debate because you have the establishment <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that is, is like a cult, too. I gotcha. mean, if you go against the establishment view mm -hmm. on science, you know, you're anti-science, you're stupid, you don't follow the science, you don't trust the science, you know. And yeah. it's amazing to me that people can't uh, determine what's really dollars and cents. You know, mm -hmm. trust the science, put a dollar on that S. Yep. For the science. And that's what we're really saying. Trust. And for the left that used to be where I used to align, I used to align with the left on a lot of social issues, uh, at least the, the U S left, let's call it. Uh, I used to align with the U S left on a lot of social issues. I used to align with them in not really liking big pharma, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and those type of things, not really loving the big corporations, but they've now turned those things into weapons. And it seems like they've been brainwashed into thinking that big pharma's their best friend. I mean, just yeah. look at the vaccine uh, yeah. during COVID. Oh, Jesus, it was a it, it was a psyop 100%. that we that we experienced. Uh, they brainwashed people into thinking at first that the pharmaceutical companies weren't going to make any profit off of it. Uh, it was it was paid for by government funding, and then Pfizer, somebody like Pfizer, goes out to have a record year in 2021, mm -hmm. 2022, making hundreds of billions of dollars, all the while uh, the people don't even realize they were told initially that Pfizer wasn't going to make any profit. And that yeah. was, that was the suggestion from the beginning. Oh, no, they're not <laughs> making any money. Oh, oh. and then yeah. the, the brilliant people that said, well, we, you know, it's a free vaccine. It's like, well, who do you think's paying for that free vaccine? It's our tax dollars. It's our government that's yep. paying for those free vaccines. Yeah, it's free to you, but you have this big corporation making billions and billions of dollars. Yep. I mean, imagine you have a company. Let's say you have bad intentions. You have mm -hmm. a company that has zero legal liability for what they do uh, with vaccines. They can't be sued over these vaccines. It's law. They mm -hmm. can't be sued over these vaccines. So they have no accountability, no financial accountability uh, they have laws in place to protect protect them up and down. That, by the way, the lobbyists of those same pharmaceuticals uh, help write those laws. Yep. Yet people think we're crazy for saying, no, this is a bunch of bullshit. Somehow we're not trusting the science. Yep. It's, uh, it's, it's a complete contradiction. Well, here, here's where it goes, man. And, and if you allow me going a little bit of a tangent. You know, when I worked in the government and special operations and, and intel and all the other things, uh, one of the things you see utilized m very effectively and more dangerously than bombs, bullets, and, and weapons is propaganda, psychological warfare, right? Psychological warfare works because, take me back again, human nature Human nature does not change. As a majority, people will all react the same. We're sheep. We are sheep. There are very few of us, and this I'm not saying this in an insulting way, there's very few people that have the level of intellect to not be included in the sheep class, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why we have politicians and business leaders and all kinds of people just steering all the sheep around. I'm not being an asshole here. It's just reality. This is the way it's always been. And the sheep, the majority, are very easily manipulated, right? And the things that are the easiest to manipulate in people are sex and fear, right? Mm -hmm. Fear will make the sheep do anything, right? That's why sheep have a shepherd. Mm -hmm. The shepherd keeps the flock safe, and it tells them where to go, takes them to the greener pastures, keeps them away from the wolves, right? Without a shepherd, all the sheep will die. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, now who's the shepherd, right? Who's steering the sheep? So what I saw with psychological warfare, especially, you know, some people call it propaganda. People don't understand that almost every facet of your life, you are being manipulated. Mm. That's what people don't get. Um, the government does it. Corporations do it. Salesmen do it. <laughs> husbands and wives do it to each other at every facet of your life. You're being manipulated in some kind of way, whether lovingly or maliciously or everything in between. Right? So what, what I've seen is, is I've seen simple propaganda make a nation burn itself alive, drag the dictator out of the house and murder him in the streets. Right? We've watched the Arab Spring. That all happened from a few lies and some propaganda. And next thing you know, 
Middle East is on fire, right? And it only happened in dictatorships, right? So the, the thing that people need to realize is we are being controlled. Now, I want you to think about this. When we grew up, we had more of a classical education, right? And we had to do, we didn't have the internet. We couldn't Google the answer to everything. We actually had to show the work in math problems, right? We had to logically work the problem out, and we got just as much credit for the work as the answer, right? Because we had to show that we knew how to get to that answer. We had to use our brain, right? There was a scientific method, right? Science, the, the whole point of science was to challenge and continually challenge what we know, you know, a hypothesis didn't become a scientific fact, you know, until it had been challenged and challenged and challenged, and it could always be disproven. And we were taught this scientific method so that we wouldn't be like the sheep that are here today, right? We had to debate. We had to use logic to form our opinions. If we wanted the answer to something, we had to go pull out a fucking catalog card and go find the book and read it or the encyclopedia and find the answer. We had to study to get to the right answer, right? We had to do the research. We were conditioned to use our brains, to think logically, to agree to disagree, to have healthy debate, to be able to solve problems. We were the last generation that got that. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the danger, and you see where I'm going with this. Oh, yeah. Think about how many people in our generation, right, COVID, for instance, who grew up with that same classical education where they were taught to use their brain, turn that fucker off the second COVID hit and the propaganda started. Sure. And didn't even use it. Now, here's where it gets really dangerous. And uh, I'm not going to say the person's name, but very wealthy, powerful, talented person, a buddy of mine, has ran the data on this. And we have lost our children. His data shows not that, like, there's a chance. They're fucking lost. They're gone. And I'm not talking about all of them. I'm talking about the majority. The majority rules the country. Mm -hmm. They're lost. Here's why they're lost. Our children don't show the work. They don't agree to disagree. They Google every answer. Everything they Google is not accurate or true. They don't have to think logically. There is no room for debate. They do what they're told. It puts the lotions on its skin or it gets the hose again. <laughs> this, is, this is the world that our children are growing up in. 14% of 15-year-olds, national standardized testing could discern fact from fiction, wow. 14%. So 14% of 15-year-olds can discern fact from fiction. This was last year, and we keep raising more and more idiots on technology, mindless drones on iPhones, eating the propaganda, getting brainwashed and conditioned to whatever the masters and powers that be decide to do to them. And 14% of 15-year-olds now can't discern fact from fiction. Think about how many adults now can and these idiots are voting, making decisions. They're the ones protesting, supporting Hamas, you know, and, and terrorism and just eating up the clips and the sound bites on the media because they know, and this is how psychological warfare and propaganda works, they don't give a fuck about me or you. We're disposable, Led. We're loudmouths right now. We're saying what we believe. We're trying to wake people up. We're trying to get people to listen. But at the end of the day, the machine will run us the fuck over, mm -hmm. right? Because they have the majority of Indians. They have the sheep. And the sheep are going to march and they're going to herd and they're going to do what they're told and they're never going to ask questions and they're never going to think straight. And what is an education now is, a, is brainwashing and indoctrination. Yeah. No one is educated anymore. You go to school to become a worker, to become a product, to become a minion in the army. You don't go to school to become an entrepreneur. You don't go to school to become a free thinker. You don't go to school to challenge ideas and constructs and thoughts. You go to school to do what the fuck you're told. And all these kids that are going to Harvard and Yale and all these things, there's people that are starting to wake up and speak up against it, but it doesn't matter because the majority is already brainwashed. The majority is already indoctrinated and the majority will flip this country. Yeah. And, and that's what I fear the most, right? Is the writing is on the wall. If you have generations that the data can now analyze and show that are lost, that are so brainwashed they're gone, it's like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Right. Once you raise a kid, majority kids... In this problem, majority of them never wake up from it. Majority of them are just lost idiots. Well, these lost idiots are able to vote or soon to be able to vote, you know, in the next couple of elections. And people are like, oh, we'll never lose America. America will stay in this path. Well, look at our kids. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and just as much as this has been done to us, the other part of the problem is we've been so brainwashed and distracted. We've allowed it collectively as adults to happen, if not participated. So, you know, I, I am not a negative person. I am not a pessimistic person, but I am a pretty realist person. The data, the numbers were fucked. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's wild talking to some of these younger mm -hmm. kids these days and they have zero social skills. I was at Home Depot mm -hmm. Uh, recently and trying to ask one of the the workers there probably looked like they were 16 17 years old uh and they were afraid to just talk to me so then i went to talk to another one same mm -hmm. thing it was like almost like they were intimidated uh by me asking i said hey uh can you get that chair up there and i said you know do you, is, it, is it the same price uh, like what is going on, man? It's okay. You can have a conversation, yeah. but they're, they're, they're so stuck in their computers or so stuck in their, uh, telephone, um, yeah. their iPhone that it's hard for them to have conversations. They have, it's not even their fault. It's not their fault that they haven't been trained. Well, it's and, really and easy for a, a parent to pacify a kid by giving them, uh, an iPhone. Well, uh, it's cause we're on the iPhone. So we're like, here, you get on the iPhone so I can be more distracted. Yes. We, we have failed as Americans. We have failed. I, I hope there's hope. I pray for there's hope. I fight for hope. I, yeah. I scream into the sky. People barely listen that there's hope. But what, what we've got to do is start parenting again. And, and what I'm fighting seems to be one of the worst outcomes, right? A child being trafficked, sexually exploited, sexually extorted, um, victimized online that can turn into physical victimization, which can lead to depression, suicide, you know, complete destruction of the function of their brain, you know, the trauma factors in children and how it forever alters the way that they think, the way that they operate, fight or flight. And these are very real things, right? But what, what I'm focused on is fighting the worst possible outcome that happens to a minority. Now, even though it's minority, it's, it's millions of mm -hmm. children. Millions of children. That's not, it's creating a, an enormous public health crisis, but all these other children that are on these same devices that maybe didn't get victimized by the predators, they're getting brainwashed too. Oh, the yeah. average kid spends 10 hours a day. On what? The 10 hours a day. New study just came out. 10 hours a day yeah. on the fucking internet. So if you're spending 10 hours a day on the internet, God knows how much time you're on the internet, probably in school or, you know, you're in school maybe eight hours a day. I don't know. Yeah. And then, well, let's be honest, kids aren't sleeping eight hours a night anymore. They're staying up on technology. But the majority of their day, they're being raised by some type of digital device. Sure. Kids aren't playing outside anymore. Kids aren't having sex anymore. Yeah, no, they're not driving either. Yeah. It's like 40% of kids out of uh, that are 16 don't get their driver's license. Because there's no independence. There is no need to be independent of your parents. There's no need to be independent of anything because now you are a slave to that machine. Yeah. You know, my 15 year old daughter, love her to death. She's awesome, smart, funny. Like, you know, I've tried my best, you know, to fight against what's happening with technology and in the current generation. Uh, we're all pretty good kid, but when she's with her friends and to be with her friends, it's always through some type of connected social device. Really? They don't, even when they're together, they play these games together. They do these things together. They are living in the metaverse already. Like people talk about the metaverse, like it's this thing that's coming where you can get a house and, you know, well, you can sit in your chair, not move, live in a virtual world, escape reality, you know, have sex with the hottest chicks, eat the best food, live in a nice home, live in some alternate reality, right? Everybody keeps talking about like this, it's this thing that's coming. What they don't realize is, is, our kids are living in it, and they don't know how to function outside of it. Uh, I'll try to say this the best way that I can. So there are some dark studies done. I'm not going to say by who or where. I'm going to talk very vaguely on this. But what they found is, is that, and these studies were not done in the scientific laboratory ethically. Mm -hmm. Let me put it this way, right? It's done by some individuals who had all the power in the world and no rules to figure out really what makes our brains function. And what they found is, is that sexuality is really at the foundation of all of our thoughts, right? But there's two, and, and I'll speak of majorities here. Generalities and majorities, because all that matters for population control and propaganda is to control the majority general population, right? Mm -hmm. Once you control them, it's over. So the 
sexuality is at the basis of the foundation of almost every decision that we make in life, right? To, to reproduce, right? And then to carry on species because then they human nature was sort of biological beings. So the manipulation of that can control, if not destroy, everything about a person if you manipulate their sexuality. And their sexuality really becomes your identity, right? You know, your true identity. Sure. So if you start to pervert and distort the sexuality, which is identity, the masculinity and the femininity, the, the need, the desire to have sex with the opposite sex, to procreate, to carry on the species, if you start to with that, not only are you messing with humanity in general and, and where we go, fertility rates, production rates, t- hormone levels, all the stuff that we're seeing decline mm-hmm. drastically, but you mess the human being up. You alter the course of their life permanently, permanently, if you mess with their identity and their sexuality. So through the study, dark psychological warfare, if it was to be waged, would be waged at attacking those very things. Because freedom comes from one thing, our individuality, our individual rights, and us as an individual to collectively fight for it. That's where freedom comes from, right? Well, if you don't, if you're not an individual... And if you don't believe in individuality and you don't believe in freedom, because you can't believe in freedom without believing in the individual, in your individual rights, then how do you know what you're going to fight for? How do you know what you're going to die for? So if I can pervert you from ever becoming an individual and distort that and, and take it off, off course, then you will never be able to function in a free society or, or fight for it or die for it. If you don't know what's worth dying for, then how do you know what's living, worth living for? Right? Yeah, no, absolutely. So with girls, it's different. Sexuality is based on attention, right? With guys, sexuality is based on the physical act, right? Get out there, spread our seed, right? So let's, let's go back to when we were kids growing up, right? Girls wanted attention. Guys wanted the act. Right. So what do we do? We spend hours upon hours on the phone with them, right? Write them letters, Oh, Take yeah. them on dates. This is before cell phones, by the way. It's before cell phones, yeah. This is a ha- like house phones, <clears throat> right? Oh, yeah. you, you know, and then your brother would pick up and make a fart noise two hours into oh, the conversation. Yeah. You, know? you had to eat, call in, you'd talk to the dad, be like, is so-and-so there? Yeah. 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 In the good old days, right? But you would give the girl all the attention she needs so that her sexual attention would start to turn into the sexual desire, the physical desire to have sex with you. That's what girls need. They need that attention. They need that love to get to the physical part. Most girls, generalities again, right? Mm -hmm. Guys, on the other hand, mostly focused on the act. They're just trying to get in those pants and will do whatever (laughs) they need to do to get in there, right? Right. Do all the dances, Sing all the songs, play all the games, do all the talks, write all the letters, whatever I got to do to get in, right? It's just reality. So here's what we've done with technology, and this is what's destroying our children. This is the simple principle. Once girls get online, they get all the attention they could ever need, right? So now they have access to a profile, access to games, access to accounts, access to followers. What that's doing is giving that little girl... More attention than she could ever handle. More dopamine hits than any little boy could ever compete with. Why is she going to waste her time on one stinky, smelly little boy and hours on the phone with one little kid that she's got a crush on when the second she creates a profile on the internet, 40, 50 men are in her DMs. Right. Telling her how pretty she is, how beautiful she is, how sexy she is, sending her gifts and compliments and likes and clicks and all day. The dopamine hits from social media, especially likes, follows, and clicks, the dopamine hits are stronger than heroin, more addictive than heroin. So these people start to get that sexual need that fulfilled the attention. No, sorry, girls start to get that attention filled online. And once they start to get their attention filled, it's like a drug. You need more. And you need more and you need more. And then you do more things to get attention. So what we're seeing is girls are sexualizing themselves digitally earlier. We've even seen up to five and six year olds sending nude pictures of themselves on cell phones. How do they even know? Uh, well, parents, sometimes when they do their job, oh uh, we'll, we'll catch it or obviously. No, I'm saying how do the kids flag. know to. They get groomed because now people have access to them. <sighs> yeah, it's just ridiculous. You, you know, you know? Um, and so girls are no longer wanting or needing or caring about the tension from some stupid smelly little boy like we were 
because they've got all these other people in the world giving it to them, telling them all these things. Well, boys, what do they do? What's the first thing you're going to do if you're a little boy, right, with an ounce of testosterone in your body? You're going to Google boobs or vagina. Oh, yeah. What happens when you Google boobs or vagina? You see them. Yeah, you see them, but not just boobs or vagina. You're right on Pornhub in, in two seconds. Yeah. And now you're seeing hardcore pornography. And at a young age where you're not even mature enough to even deal with it, and this destroys adults' marriages and sex lives, mm -hmm. What's a kid is helpless against this shit. Yeah. We're seeing five- and six-year-olds addicted to porn. What? what? What happens with pornography is this. Pornography, there's, there's a loop with it where you need more fetishes, where you need more things, you know. You start off with just a guy and a girl having sex in missionary position, and next thing you know, it's a gangbang of multiple races and a midget running around with a rebel flag, and you need that <laughs> to get off. Because that's pornography, you're never satisfied because there's never that physical intimacy, which eventually becomes something that you don't get from, you know, pornography, because eventually there is no physical intimacy, and get, kids get so addicted to the point to the point where they can't even ejaculate anymore. Because there's not a physical part there. There's not a physical touch. There's not another person there. Wow. Right? So we're seeing kids, little boys, why am I going to go give little Susie an attention where she's not going to put out? She's probably just going to kiss me on the playground when I can go watch this girl get railed by three different guys. Mm. This is what's happened to little boys. Because we're giving them access to this stuff. At such young ages, it is destroying their minds. So now you're seeing kids, one, not procreating, not wanting to get married, not wanting to have physical sex with each other because they're getting all the sexual desires and dopamine hits that they could in these pockets. We are destroying humanity. But not only is it destroying humanity with sex and kids not reproducing, it's destroying testosterone. Testosterone comes from the hunt, from the chase, from the fight, right? That's why you have all these weak beta kids out there because they're not getting out there and playing sports and chasing girls and, you know, fighting for that girl's affection or getting punched in the face at, at, at the, in the playground and having to fight back. They're not riding their bikes and skinning their knees. They're not being kids anymore and they're not doing what's necessary to become men anymore. The effects of destroying sexuality are destroying humanity. Yeah. And destroying our sexes. So with the little boys low on testosterone, doesn't need to check the girls, it's jacking off to all this porn. Next thing you know, it's bisexual stuff. Next thing is whatever. That little boy is not going to have the testosterone to even want to be a man. Mm. So it's going to start to become homosexual. It's going to start to question its identity. We have maliciously done this to other countries. And I'm not going to say how, why, when, or what. But we have maliciously done this to other countries, and now I'm watching it maliciously happen to our country. So you, you saw this done in uh, other Heard countries? About it. You heard about it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A friend told me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's wild. So you're saying that the playbook's already out. Oh, the playbook's out. And you're watching it and repeat. Well, look what's happening to our kids. I challenge someone, I challenge anyone to test me on this. Facts there. You can take everything back to the perversion of sexuality in our children through the internet because it is removing them from humanity. We are taking human beings that require human interaction, human touch, you know, that positive feedback, that mirroring to progress and grow. And they are growing up in a digital world that they're not prepared for, or they're not meant for. We're letting technology, artificial intelligence, and social constructs raise our children instead of human nature and the things required to naturally develop as a human being. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's pretty obvious yeah. what's happening. A lot people, of people are in complete denial, though. I mean, there's, there's people that oh, God, you know, yeah. they just don't believe it's happening. Like, no, it's not. Like, how are you not seeing what's happening with our society in America? Like, yeah. what are what are you watching? Thousands of years of human history, men and women have been men and women. Now, there has been sexual perversion to extents and extremes and homosexuality, and I'm not saying I'm against any of that, but now we're under complete perversion because technology has came in. Men and women have been relatively unchanged on their outlook on life until what? The past 20 years. What happened in 1997? Yeah, the internet. iPhone. iPhone. Was it 97? Oh, sorry, 2007. Okay, 2007. 2007, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, man, I've been blown up a lot. It's okay. But 2007, the iPhone comes out. Yeah. After that. Because now you've got a mind control device in your hand. Now you have access to it. People don't see the danger to it because we've all been blindsided by it. Well, hold, hold on. I, I don't know if we've ever really been blindsided, though, because I mean, you take what happened with Edward Snowden when he announced that the NSA was uh, mm -hmm. collecting all of our information. 
yeah. I had been very vocal before that about the fact that the NSA was doing that. You mm -hmm. know, I was uh, an activist in a way. Yeah. And uh, when that came out, the country didn't really seem to care. They didn't really seem to care that, that the they NSA- They a traitor. Well, yeah, but I'm saying mm -hmm. like, you know, they, they didn't seem to care that the government was- collecting all of our information. Oh, what's the big deal? Oh, it wasn't an outrage before yeah. the, the mainstream was saying, Oh, it's just not happening. That's bogus. That's this, that's that. Then when it got out there, nobody even really cared. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't really feel like we've been blindsided by it. I think that, you know, people have been seeing this coming for a long time. The problem is people have continuously said either it's not happening or they don't care. Well, what's the point. big deal? Well, good point, but also the the very system manipulates us. Sure, right? They control the information. I mean, tell me what freedom is in the simple fact that half the things we talked about today can discretionally get clips and podcasts deleted from the internet. Sure, right? We haven't insulted anyone. We've just talked about reasons and causes and methods, right? We might have insulted some midgets. Yeah. Which I, I'm a huge fan of midgets. I am too. I think it's really cool. You know, that, you know, it's awesome, right? <laughs> but, uh, but man, uh, <laughs> all right. but you so know, the, the thing, man, is, is look where, where we're headed, right? Yeah. Right now, BlackRock, BlackRock Vanguard State Street, three private equity funds. People are like, what's it's like private equity, individual investors, right? Nothing to see here, nothing to worry about. Well, they have boards of directors and are controlled by a, a corporate machine. They put together an ESG that's controlling every corporation's decisions, right? Right now, just to get money. So you have this, these entities that control 22 trillion of the 38 trillion in the S&P 500 documented, probably more than 22 trillion now. That was about a year ago, the article I read about this. Uh, that journalist actually got fired after writing it. Um, but what's interesting is, is they own all major media. Own it. The controlling shares, which means they control the board, right? So they own even Tesla, right? So Elon Musk, the controlling stake, right? Or one of the controlling stakes is owned by a private equity firm of Tesla. So you look at how this has happened to our co economy, right? Our country, and we start to see the monopolization of media, big tech, social media. You start to see also simultaneously the monopolization of the human brain hmm. and group think and group speak. And I'm like, man, nah, no way. They don't have anything to do with that, <laughs> right? right? You know, we, people like to pretend that, that we're free. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the joke right now is yeah we're free i can for the most part go do what i want right now within the within the law but what happens once i step on their toes oh that's the thing i mean the the, the department of justice as weaponized as it's become mm -hmm. uh you know they have a tremendous amount of power and they if do. they want to take you out they're going to take you out there's nothing you can do about it yeah. I mean, they're going I mean, to, if, if, even if you beat it, which I think it's like about one, they, they win like 99% of the cases mm -hmm. uh, that they, they put forward. But even if you were to beat it, you, you're still going to get drugged through the mud. Yeah. You know, they're still going to do what they can to ruin your life. And, you know, I don't think, I, I think there's, there's probably a lot of good people that are U.S. district attorneys. I really do. I think that, that, that yeah, there's a lot, a lot of, of good people. I like a lot but, of them. But... The power that they have mm -hmm. and how weaponized it's become is too much. It wasn't designed to do that. Well, the, it's the, we, we shouldn't constantly be afraid of our government. I mean, well, and that, that's, that's where I'm at. It's like, you know, yeah. I, I know how powerful they are. I know they could completely take me out if I wanted to. I that actually keeps you. me, uh, you know, it keeps mm -hmm. me from speaking all the things that uh, I really believe. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and I speak pretty openly, but I, I'm not, a, I'm not, I don't go all out. I definitely withhold hmm. uh, certain to. things because, you know, I don't want the, the mob to come after me. The mob that uh, in many ways can uh, dictate whether the U.S. Department of Justice comes after me for some 
stupid reason. They don't like what I said. Oh, let's go find something mm -hmm. to get him on. 100%. And you know this from the, the DAs that we know. And you're, like I do, I really believe that most of them are good people, but they can get you on anything. They can, they, they can oh. pretty much find something on someone. You're, that, it's too easy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we're, we're all sitting ducks and, <laughs> You, you know, and that's the question, right, is, is how how much do you want to push back against the machine? How much do you want to fight it? Uh, because not only what what I've seen in in my brief four years, like four-ish years of functioning in the civilian world back here in the U.S. after, you know, military time was coming to an end, was that most of the people, the working class people, the federal agents, the district attorneys— the, the, the boots on the ground, the majority of them are good Americans. They want to do the right thing, but they all work in a bureaucratic system where, you know, politicized from the top down, where they can clean house of all leadership in any federal agency, DOJ included. They can just clean house. Hey, we don't like your politics. You're gone. Um, same thing with judges and everything else, how they get appointed. So we're living now, and, and, and granted, both sides do this, right? I mean, when, when Trump was in, it, you know, it, it happened, and now that Biden's in, there's a you know, complete sides. left watch. Both sides do it. I think you can objectively kind of say right now that the Biden administration and the bureaucrats that they put in charge of all these entities have probably pushed things, in my opinion, more extreme than any administration ever has, um, yeah, I would and, agree. And and it's getting dangerous now because what they've what they're doing with Trump, love him, hate him, however you feel about Trump, is in my mind, it's not about Trump. What it's about is they're showing people if we can hang out a president to dry, if we can bring charges on him, if we can make his life hell, if we can silence him, we can remove him from social media, we can charge him with anything. Imagine what we can do to you, little guy. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, that's exactly to right. me. That's the psyop. That's the play. It, well, and when, mm -hmm. whenever you indict, you know, you think about President Trump, mm -hmm. what they've done to him. You know, over the years, I haven't been the biggest Trump fan. Yeah. But I can absolutely see exactly uh, what they're doing and know that it's not fair and know that they're picking on the guy. Yeah. And know that he he poked a, a, a bear that's bigger than him. It seems like 100 percent, but and it's bigger than the president. It's much bigger than you. Oh, of course, it's much bigger than me. Of course. So, so who are we, you know, to 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 speak out and accept change? And you know what the psychological play here is? This is a very normal play. If you study history, you know this is a thing. If you real history, not doctorate history, uh, it repeatedly happens. You you oh, hang the. What happens when you live in the hood? Nashville. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> okay, go ahead. God, this sh shitty old house. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> in the middle of the hood. Yeah. Well, it's half. It's the gentrified hood now. Well, no, Almost. we got the hood across the street. Yeah. I, I love my. I, I love my neighbors across the street. No. Uh, you know, I have more friends over there. I think in the in the rest of the neighborhood. Well, you, well, you got Brando living over there. Right well, now, now Brando, yeah, Brando's actually living over now. So that, that's yeah. that, that's even different. I love. Yeah. I'm like, hey, Brando, why don't you move over here for good? We're having a great time. No, that's all. Well, yeah, he he did get a, a shitty deal with that that fire in his building. Yeah. No, we good. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad. Uh, glad it worked out. But man, like, yeah, it, it, it's it's it kind of makes you feel hopeless, man. You know, and and for me right now, uh, I'm gonna try to talk around this, but you know, I was working on trying to help some legislation out to protect our children, right? To to like basically give big take big tech an out. Say hey you know, change this, you won't be responsible for anything, this bill, like anything that's happened before this, just change this, allow this to be disclosed, and, um, you know, just because to keep it safe, they have fought this to death, right? Um, what, what I'm starting to get the feeling of, and, and you know, I can't prove this, but it, it seems pretty obvious to a, to a logically-minded person, is that... Children are the product now, right? And the sooner they can get their hooks into controlling the child and collecting data from the child, turning them into a product that they can sell, manipulate, advertise to, and then basically control, then that's the more control they have over 
the sheep. So it's worth more to them to make our children a product than it is to protect them, Mm -hmm. to let them be free from the chains of technology. That's what people don't get is technology is just another form of slavery. And I think most people who are on social media or utilize some form of technology, whether it be video games, alternate worlds that people live in, um, they are a slave to it in some way. It Just like a drug, it controls part of their day. They have to use it. They have to be on it. They have to check it. You know, um, when you see people saying, I have to take, you know, like they post about it to let everyone know, uh, I'm taking a month off of social media for my health. If you're taking a month off, then you got a fucking problem, right? It's it's controlling. It's it's hurting something in your life so bad. Not only are you going to take a month off, but you have to publicly announce it. Yeah. You feel the need, right? Status update. You well, know, and what cracks me up is when they're back on it in a week. Yeah, you know, oh, that's, it's, that's it's a so pers- funny. It's a personal it's favorite so of mine. Funny. Yeah, uh, but it, it's just the control that it has over people and. It, we're all being victimized. We're all being manipulated, but our children are getting the worst of it because we had a chance. We had a chance. We had a chance to grow up without it and then to determine to some extent how we're going to utilize it in our lives, right? Because we got to logically look at it. Now, I, and there's some days where I spend way too much time on Instagram sending memes to you and other friends oh, or yeah. videos. Or, got that meme you know, game going. Oh, yeah, dude. The meme game's good. Well, I can't say where most of them come from because <laughs> he'd kill me. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, um, it, you know, it's, uh, but the, you know, the, the truth is, is, is we are living in this world where it, it is such, we have allowed it to become such part of life that we're not seeing the dangers and the downfalls of it. When I got my driver's license, my mom, got me a permit, right? Made me go get a permit. Then I had to go drive around the neighborhood with her and my dad. And I had to prove that I could drive good enough to where they would take me to the DMV to allow me to, to get my license because parents still control your life, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they got me a car. I had to prove to them that I was responsible, right? Just to get in a car, which at that time was considered to be a very dangerous thing, something that I could get in and lose my life in right. if I did something stupid. Well, we're handing children the most dangerous device that's ever been handed to children where it can not only allow your thoughts to be manipulated, but allow you to get addicted to something more than a drug, allow you to have access to the world. But, you know, consequently the world has access access to to you. you. Yeah. We're giving that to children at three, two, three years old. I mean, good luck, buddy. Yeah. No training, no training wills, no education, little to no oversight. And then parents that actually give a fuck a little bit are maybe putting an application that requires children to go Google how to get around it to get to the mm. bad stuff, you know. Um, and then uh, other you have the uh, parents on the other end of extreme keeping their children from tech, homeschooling them, you know, raising them probably in the, you know, the, the Quaker bubble. I don't know what you'd call that, you know, Amish thing, you know, pretending to do it like that. I don't think that's the right answer either because, you know, the child does eventually have to succeed in this new world, like it or not. So they had to be able to have some access to technology, but it's what access they have to technology. Mm-hmm. You know, should you let a 12 or 14 or 15 year old on social media? Absolutely fucking not. But do most of American parents allow that to happen nowadays? Yes. Now look at us. Right. Look where we're at. Well, it's, um, it's scary times, but... You know, I'd like to think that we'll be able to eventually overcome that and uh, figure out how to unite the country rather than, you know, yeah. divide the country and figure out how we can get the kids off of the social media. I think we should completely ban TikTok. I mean, it's... Oh, it's got to be banned. It's And I hear people say, oh, it's the only thing telling the truth. It's, it's like, not really, you know, mm. it's programmed by the Chinese government. Okay? 100%. You think... You know, a simple question. This is how you know people just, there's not a lot of people that use their brains these days. You don't have to. If <laughs> if the Chinese government doesn't want the best for America, what would make us think that when they have an algorithm uh, and software to manipulate minds, that they would do it in a way that would be positive for our country? Of course they would do it in a way that would be negative. 100%. Um, and uh, that's, that's why the issue. Why are we allowing it? I don't know. I don't, I I. I don't know. Is it money? Is it we don't care? Mm-hmm. Or is it people are part of the plan? I think that, I think, I think on, on one side, it's 
I don't think people realize that how big of a problem it is. Yeah. I really don't think that they, I think they brush it aside, you know, but um, I well, think that's probably uh, some of what's going on. And then I think there are people that like China that are in our government that, um, oh, yeah. well, look what know, they don't mind it. Look, Newsom <clears throat> just did in California. Well, I solved the homeless problem in a day. Unbelievable. And, and right? uh, put out the red carpet and Chinese flags. Can you believe that? Well, I, I'm so mad about that. I, I, I try not to think about it. I mean, yeah, yeah. he just cleans up the streets. He was just over there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think another one is, you know, with the with the left. I think the left likes it because mm -hmm. they get to brainwash the kids in their social justice um, yeah. uh, ideas. Pronouns and sexuality, man. We, Destroying identity. We got a... Uh, we got a... Uh, we got a TikTok a, a couple of weeks ago for the Ed Clay show. And three of the first five videos were taken down. They were going That's, viral. Like one got 80 mm, plus thousand views like that. really quickly. And uh, it was about masculinity, the fall of society oh, man. and propaganda. And they took them down, man. Oh, uh, uh, who's that with? Uh, Andrew? Oh, uh, no, it was Arthur. Arthur oh, Kwan Arthur Lee. Kwan. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, man, he's, I love that guy. Well, but that's the problem is you can't talk about those things because that's the very thing that are attacking. Oh, I know. It's just you like, don't need men. A, a, a society without strong men will fail overnight. The only reason we're here is because there's not a lot of strong yeah. men. Here we go. We just got you deleted again. That's it, dude. That's well, that's the but, whole point. But identity, man. And that's why I always go back to identity. And that's how I get like, you know, people and people challenge me on this. And I really don't care. Uh, but. Your sexuality is the foundation that's been proven in studies. Maybe it'll be declassified one day. Um, but the problem with it is, is it's that chain reaction. Because if I don't have an identity, if I don't know for a fact, my name's Matt Murphy. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm a man. You know, and I fought for my country. I, or I, at this point, I will fight for my country. I will put my life on my on the line for what I believe in, for my family and my friends. And I will become a killing machine in order to do so. And I will sacrifice my happiness and my youth and all of these things so that this country that I love so much, that I took advantage of in, in youth and didn't appreciate, I'll die for it now. Had all this chain reaction of events in my life not happened that started with the core of I'm Matt Murphy and I'm a man, and this is where I stand and this is what I believe in, had that never happened, none of those other things would ever happen, ever would have happened, because I have no identity. Without any identity, I have no, I, no, there's no ground to stand on. If I don't identify, if I don't even know who I am today, then what am I going to fight for? Right. What am I going to die for? Once you manipulate that, it's over. So, yes, you have to destroy masculinity, and that's why testosterone is decreasing is because kids are sitting on these social media apps and video games all day yeah. and jacking off all day. Yeah. You know, testosterone comes from the hunt, comes from the chase, comes from the fight. Uh, so you can naturally deplete it out. I think some study came out, and I don't know you can look this up, but it said that men will not be able to naturally reproduce in like 20 to 30 years mm. because testosterone is declining so much, semen counts are going down really? and they're saying we'll no longer be able to naturally produce. Well, talk about population and idiot control. You make good points and they are emasculating men. There's yeah. no doubt about it. I mean, they're, they're teaching society that masculinity is toxic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, men have the highest suicide rates. They have, uh, a lot of things actually going against them, mm -hmm. uh, but they're they're way more demonized than. Yeah. Well, it's not good to be masculine. No, it's not good to be masculine. It's not good to be white. No, it's not good to be no, masculine so and white. I mean, that's it, that's what it, it's okay to say that with society. If we were to talk about black people the way that a lot of white people, black people, different races talk about white people, mm -hmm. I mean. It would be considered horrible, and I wouldn't do it because I don't look at people by the color of the skin. But somehow I, we've normalized and made it okay mm -hmm. to talk about white people because of the race. Well, it's because we've all been conditioned to play identity politics. Yes. We see the world in identities, not in people. When I look at Ed Clay, I don't see a white guy that looks like a, a better-looking Jesus. <laughs> what I see is I just see a guy that I respect, right? Because I've taken the time to get to know him and have conversations. I see a friend. Mm -hmm. a close friend now. And I don't think about, well, Ed's this white guy who's 
you know, succeeded in life and uh, co- uh, conquered all these different, you know, arenas <laughs> because he's white. Yeah, no, it's because Ed's a smart dude and he's motivated and yeah. he and he's good with people and he gives a fuck. So much privilege, man. Yeah, yeah, privilege. I mean, I I am the epitome dude. of white privilege. Oh, God, I, I I wish white privilege was a real thing. I probably. You know, life might be a little better off, you know, but I, I chose the, you know, the, the nonprofit path. I chose to save people. I'm not complaining about that. No, I, you, know, you know, I believe that, that there is privilege, <laughs> not necessarily white privilege or it's like, you, mm. you know, certain people are born into better situations. But then again, it's yeah. all how you look at things. For instance, if I was raised with a lot of money, I mm. might not have had the perseverance and the drive to succeed. I look at it as a blessing. If yep. I wouldn't have got arrested when I was 20 years old and got locked up, uh, I might not have got off of drugs and stopped doing the things that I was doing at the time. I might've gotten shot and killed because I was a wild dude. No. You know, it's, it's how you look at things. It's like, I, I could definitely be a victim to my circumstances, yes. uh, but I get, had the choice. I have the choice to, to choose to look at it differently. And that's what people don't understand. They have their perspective of, oh, I'm such a victim. I'm so mm-hmm. oppressed. When in reality, yeah, you are because you say you are, because yeah. you actually believe it. That's the difference. I don't believe it. I was not oppressed. I was not a victim to my circumstances. I refused to I refused to believe that. You thrive from your circumstances. Absolutely. That's what you should do. We all have things yeah. that are up against us. And if our worldview is that all these things are against us, we can always find like every single day of my life, I can find something that's against me. And I choose not to look at it like that. Because they are every single yeah, day. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There's plenty that's a... That's you choose a, to fight them or be a little bitch about it. Exactly. You and, know? you know, you stand up yeah. and you fight back. Amen. And, you know, you, you don't become a victim to your circumstances. That's why people are so unhappy in the world right now. Oh, yeah. Because they're victims to their circumstances. circumstances. Mm-hmm. If you live life as a victim, you're going to be unhappy. 100%. It's that simple. Well, if you need a safe space, if you want to, you know, if you want to play that card, then it's it's so easy to blame every everyone else. Of course it is. And, and man, like I, I, you know, I told you that earlier in the talk, I took advantage of life and, um, you know, didn't appreciate what I had growing up once it was get handed to me. And I joined the military. And, and the reason, I, I don't think I've ever said this publicly or, or out loud, but I wanted to become a Green Beret you know, for myself, but the way that I got there is I thought about every person that I had wrong or taken advantage of, you know, and how much I let my parents down who did so much for me, you know, to the, got to the point where I'm not uh, accomplishing anything within my potential from teachers to coaches, all the people that had fought with me and for me, you know, or against me, you know, at times. And that, that thought, made me put one foot in front of the other in selection. That thought made me not give up, made me not quit, right? Um, Because I knew I had the potential to be something better, right? And um, and, and we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to fuck up. And that's the problem with cancel culture these days. They will destroy an individual's life, their career on a soundbite or a clip or or uttering the wrong word, right? Fuck those people, man. I've had it with that shit. And, and and this is one of the things I want to get violent on is is you have to look at the 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 qual the quantity right the the life as a whole you have yeah. to look at what this person has done for humanity before you start to try to destroy them all for saying a word just because you're angry at yourself and blame your circumstances oh, yeah. right because that person saying that word is not the reason your life sucks you choosing to just do nothing but bitch and complain about how bad your life sucks instead of make it better is a reason why your life sucks. Right. And, but that again comes back to identity. If you don't know what you identify as and what you're proud of and what you're going to work hard for, then you're just going to join the masses, uh, woe, bitching and crying and woe is me. Well, yeah. And, and they're, and they're training people to think like that. Group I, mean, I was at a, at a dinner a couple months ago and, uh, the girl at the dinner was talking about, she's a, a, a black girl. She was talking about how much she hated white people. I mean, she has, and she used the word hate. And uh, hated men, especially white men. But that's okay to say. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and I gave pushback, of course. I love that. And uh, all she could do was speak louder than me mm-hmm. and have a non-coherent argument that was embarrassing, to say the least. And um, it just shows you that, you know, if I were to say the same thing about her as a black lady, mm-hmm. uh, I would be considered a racist. 
Yes. Um, it's the opposite of what, what Martin Luther King Jr. talked about, to not judge by the color mm-hmm. of the skin, but by the content of somebody's character. Mm-hmm. She went on to attack Joe Rogan and my friendship with Joe Rogan. Really? And I'm like, have you ever watched a podcast? Oh, oh, oh. Hello. No, of course she hadn't watched a podcast because she's watching sound bites mm-hmm. to where they can take things out of context. And but she's sure of it. And she's so she, she so wanted to be right that she couldn't see another side. And she's so mm-hmm. sure about her feminism, which I don't even think she knows the four phases of feminism yeah. uh, that, that have gone on and what, what oh. draw uh, drives feminism now, which truly is so maddening. It's it's unbelievable how uneducated people are, and they oh, no, act they're like, educated. Yeah, they're they're, they're overeducated and bullshit. They're like educated this, from right? TikTok University. Yeah. She's educated mm-hmm. on TikTok yep. University. She got her sound bites on yep. TikTok, and they make her. Well, right. Colleges give them this crap now. Yeah, there's no longer a logical constructed education where you have to learn. Right, you just repeat doctrine, right. repeat propaganda, and and that's why they get so angry. Because you can't, when you've repeated propaganda, when you believe in a lie, there is not a logical way to argue for that lie unless you right. are hyper intelligent, right? right? Then you can, you know, string some stuff together to confuse an idiot. But once you have, once your propaganda, you're regurgitating it in yeah. a room of people who don't think like you or who will challenge you with logic, right. re- rational oh, yeah. thought, and common sense, it just sends them from zero to 60 in anger because there is no other way to react because now their brain cannot formulate a proper response or a counter argument and it, they just get mad. Well, yeah, it was like fight or flight. Yeah. I mean, she mm-hmm. just couldn't, her head was going to explode and how dare her. Mm-hmm. I actually pushed back and I wasn't yelling. She was yelling. Oh, really? I was just asking specific questions uh, that honestly I knew she wouldn't have the answer to because she hasn't really thought about that much. I knew she wouldn't have the answer to because if she were to answer it truthfully, she'd be like, oh yeah, I am mm-hmm. a bigot. You know, and, th- and we've okayed yeah. uh, bigotry. I mean, it's, it's, it's now okay for people to be yeah. bigots towards white people. And it's not okay to be a bigot to anyone, in my opinion. And right. that's what we got to stand up against. And uh, it was just a, a very telling moment, probably one of the most telling moments uh, of the year for me, because, you know, it, it was somebody that uh, it was unexpected. And I haven't really been around someone that really shared how much they hated uh, another group since. Mm-hmm. Maybe I was around some racists in high school, and yeah. I pushed back against that too. Hundred percent. And um, you know, you look at that that same mob. I mean, I used to support. I, I supported gay marriage, for instance, before uh, before Obama did, before mm. Hillary Clinton did. I, I thought it was. I thought they should have the right to be married. But that same now radical leftist mob uh, is the the bullies now. Before they weren't the bullies. Before they were getting bullied by society. Yes. Now they're the bullies. And I've been fighting bullies my whole life. I've always tried to stand up for people mm-hmm. and to stand up for groups that are being bullied. I never thought it was going to be pushed right back at mm-hmm. me by the same people that I wanted to help years ago. Communism 101, brother. It is. Well, and, and that's the thing. And that's what scares me. If you look at what Nazi Germany did to the Jews, they didn't just throw them in concentration camps overnight there there is a you have to make them the enemy right mm-hmm. you have to blame you know if you want to get rid of a certain race or ethnic ethnicity you have to make them the problem right and then you start to have to dehuman dehumanize them right and that's what they did to the jews it was a slow dehumanization process yeah. that it by so when it got to the point to where they're throwing the yudin man in the oven you know um and gas chambers and everything else most of society was like, yeah, you know, yeah, you know, and and totally cool with it, uh, because collectively they had been brainwashed. That propaganda had worked. And what really scares me now is, is where does this stop? You know, now when does violence against white people to take out your anger for them being the 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 result, the colonizers. You know, the, yeah, the colonizers and the oppressors and the reason for all of your problems and misfortunes. When does it become acceptable to be violent? And when, you know, I'm seeing a lot of similarities between what happened to the Jews in, in Nazi Germany um, starting to happen to white people in the Western world. Well, and it's happening to the Jews again as well. Oh, 100%. I mean, well, the, 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 the amount of anti-Semitism yeah. that's going on right now publicly. That's uh, insane. It's, 
insane. And that's, I, I'm against it across the board. I'm against it. If someone wants to be that way to a black person, an Asian person, any of it, yeah. it's, it's, it's wrong period. And I thought, and, and this is, this has been like a big aha moment the last few years. I thought that was generally agreed upon, but yeah. it's not agreed upon. Now it is okay to hate somebody because of the color of their skin, as long as it's white people, the two which is wild. Like I, I was never, for, I mean, like, I've never been for it ever. Mm -hmm. So the suggestion that, uh, that, that somehow it would be okay against white people, people blows my mind. Uh, because I thought it was one of those things that generally we agreed on in American society that racism or bigotry is bad mm -hmm. towards somebody because of the, the, you know, the color of their skin or, you know, what they look mm -hmm. like or any of those things. Well, we don't live in America anymore. And I think that's the pill that people need to swallow and wake up to. Yeah. The second we entered a two tier justice system where justice for thee, not for me, um, you know, started to occur. We were no longer living the American dream of equality for all. Well, when have we know? not had a two tier justice system? Though? That's true. There's the, the elites have always had the ability to, I think now it's just a lot more overt and being weaponized yeah. right against their enemies and, and dissenters, you know, and the other thing that is really telling of how we're living in America right now is that freedom is no longer the dream, Right. It's no longer the dream of, of, of the left, right? And then you've stated it. You know, the hippie movement in the 60s and 70s was, you know, freedom, smoke pot, dance, be happy, you know, get away from the chains of corporate America and, and the white man, right. you know, and these you know, those institutionalized systems and, and, and live free. That was liberals sure. there. Now liberals are eating this shit up. They want the corporations to tell them what they do. They want, you know, to, to have group think. They don't want to challenge the opinions of the media. They will regurgitate and spew out anything they hear on CNN or MSNBC. And it's now safe for them in, in their weakened state because liberals in the 60s and 70s had that tes testosterone was rocking and rolling. Mm -hmm. but they were using it. To, to make love, not war, mm -hmm. and, you know, make babies and make peace. And, and, you know, they did a good job with it. You know, they were, there was still humanity in the 60s and 70s. Now we've destroyed humanity, and we just have a bunch of minions just repeating what they're told and getting really angry because here's, here's the thing that's just as dangerous as, as believing in propaganda, even more dangerous in, in my opinion, is because of... The way that in the short time that the Biden administration, what they've done to the economy and, and the lasting ramifications of nothing changes, the generation now that we've already made angry, right? The hate white people, group think, you know, siding with terrorists, you know, hating the Jews, all of this insanity that's happening in our colleges and with youth across the country gets worse because economically, fiscally, this generation for a majority is not going to live, be able or have the same opportunity to leave, live the American dream no. that we did. They're not going to be able to own homes in their early 20s or, you know, drive nice cars, start businesses, do all these kind of things. It's going to be a very small minority of those yeah. people who will break the chains in that, which for us, most people in their mid-20s owned a home. Yeah. You know, now they're still living in their parents' basement. And now that's the majority. No, it, it's changed a lot, and mm -hmm. you know, they've they've convinced people, you know, well, they've convinced people of a lie. I mean, mm -hmm. and well, we'll close here. Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. gonna let you have the last word, but oh. uh, I want to say this: you know, the suggestion that America is this giant racist country is a complete lie. You've traveled the world. Yeah. I've traveled the world. I've lived in I think four different countries. So, I mean, racism here is nothing. It's, it's literally nothing joke. compared to, you know, you go to Colombia, for instance, Colombians, you know, black people are treated awfully yes. there. Um, you Darker know, skin Colombians are treated worse than lighter skin ones. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Mexico. I mean, I've, I've heard what people say about black people um, from mm -hmm. people. I would never hear. Now, I'm not saying that all Mexicans are, for instance, mm -hmm. are, are racist by any means, but I am saying that. I've got comments to, about black people mm -hmm. from Mexicans. And I'm like, I would never hear that comment in America. And I've heard it a few times. Like it's, you know, you have a lot of people from Haiti going over there right now nope. um, and they don't like it. Um, they yeah. don't like it at all. You know, if you go to the middle East, 
I mean, it's it's a pretty racist place. The worst uh, in, yeah. in the Middle East. You know, there's there's a lot, and and you you look at where else in the world do you have a country that is as diverse as America? And it's accepting. Exactly, right? it doesn't exist. Yeah. What Europe? Yeah. What's what's Europe? There's like one to two percent black people in Europe. You know, people yeah. are like, oh well, uh, I'd like it to be like socialist Europe, and you know, different different places in, in Europe. And it's like, oh really? Well, there's not a whole lot of black people there. Yeah, it's mostly white, and yeah. you want to act like well, in Muslim now, and it's turned it's racism on a pendulum over there. Yes, well, is, and, you know, France yeah. is about I think it's around uh, ten to twelve percent uh, mm -hmm. black uh, mm -hmm. in France. It's the only country in the EU that has that much, but the average is between one and two percent. Yeah. It's mostly white. Yet you want to be like those countries that have no diversity. No, America has diversity, and. Yeah. We are not a racist country. There's bad apples in every country, and there are definitely are some racists. But yeah, of course. I can't remember the last time I've heard the N word from a, a white person, uh, other than repeats of years ago calling people out, you know, for mm -hmm. for for something they they said 30 years ago, 20 years ago, yeah. even 15 years ago. You know, you think about the, yeah. the the rap music. I mean, yes, I used to say it when I was rapping a song. I would say Canceled. it with my black friends. Yeah. It's not a, it wasn't a big deal. Now, I, I don't say it now. I mean, yeah. when I'm listening to a song, I'm like, oh, you, I don't even, I won't, I won't allow myself to memorize rap anymore. Yeah. I don't even listen that to way, it anymore, to be honest. That way. I loved rap. I'm not going to be slipping yeah. up if I'm jamming in the car, uh, you know, didn't say it. Don't even know the words anymore. But, you know, oh, racism is not a thing it in America isn't. anymore. It's not a real thing. Well, the, that's the problem, man. Like I said, you know, uh, education is only as good as an educator. Sure. And in what these kids are being taught is just just downright lies and, and fantasies, obviously, to make them manipulated and controllable. Uh, these kids haven't traveled. Uh, their their worldview is very manipulated. This is how powerful it is. You have American children getting behind and supporting a fucking terrorist group. Right. If you thought. Anything that we've said on this podcast is not true. Let me rephrase that. American children, college-educated American children across this country and youth in high schools are majority overwhelming supporting Hamas, who murders women, men, and children, rapes women and children, and throws homosexuals off the rooftops and murders homosexuals, stones women, for having sex before or before or outside of marriage to death, stones them to death and allows a man or, or, or a dad to murder or do whatever he wants with his daughter. And American children raised in this country are supporting them so violently that they stormed the Capitol building last yeah. night. That the That's the America we live in today. A uh, poll said 51%. Uh, of 18 to 24 year olds said that they supported, they thought Hamas's actions were justified. justified. And people hit me on my Instagram yeah. thinking that by saying that I, I support, I didn't support the palace, the innocent Palestinians there, yeah. or that I was saying uh, something for Israel. I was just saying 51% support Hamas and people's heads exploded because they can't take mm. in the people don't understand more. They like, don't, they, 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 uh, there were a lot of comments that said, no, they were saying they supported Palestine. I was like, no, they weren't saying that. They were saying specifically yeah. they thought Hamas was justified. That was the question. Didn't say anything about Israel. Didn't say anything about Palestine. Yeah. Was Hamas actions that killed 1,200 Israelis justified? 51% said yes. Uh, yep. And that is the country we are living in right now. And so, you know, if you don't like the way that sounds, and you're like, well, that's not true, look it up and look at the wording of the question. Because I got a lot of shit from that. And then I got a lot of... A lot of people saying that they did support Hamas oh, and those man. type of things as well. But, um, you know, the um, mob came out suggesting I was stupid. I wasn't really following what's going on. I guarantee I know more about that situation than most Americans. I'm 100%. not a giant, giant expert. Uh, like there are some people who are major experts, of course. But, you know, I read a lot and I followed it very closely for the last 25 years, longer than a lot of these people have been alive. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the people that are protesting have been alive. And, uh, you know, I'm not an idiot. Uh, contrary mm -hmm. to some of my actions, 
<laughs> they I'm not are. an idiot. Well, you, you know, know we uh, every 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 genius makes stupid decisions sometimes. Like, yeah, fair, fair share. But brother, that's because they've been indoctrinated. Yeah. And, and this is where I, you know, caution people. We're allowing children who have never probably never been in a fist fight, who have probably never been punched in the face, who are just as scared to bully as they are to defend a bully from someone else from a bully, who don't understand adversity, have never really been, you know, essentially haven't been punched in the mouth, have never been challenged. They've all gotten trophies. Everybody's a winner. Everybody's special. Everybody's unique. They've been lied to their whole life that you can be anything that you want to be. You can't. That's not the American dream. It's you can be anything you're capable of, right? It's how you determine what you become in America. No one's going to hand you shit. But these kids have been told that. And now they're just angry and volatile and they don't understand war. They don't understand conflict. We went and decimated a lot of the Middle East because of what happened on 9-11 with the Twin Towers. And yeah. we can, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but we went over there, Iraq, Afghanistan, and many other places. The Arab Spring came out of it, and we, we wrecked shop fighting terrorism. And they, they got some good licks in, too. War is hell. No one wins, really, in war, uh, uh, you know, till the end, right? Right. Until the end... Things happen in war that are horrific, that can't be explained. But the difference is, is is this. Israel did not have a choice to conduct war. The second Hamas came in there and viciously murdered, ununiformed, innocent men, women, and children in their homes. That is an act of terrorism. That is an act of cowardice. Those people need to be the things that I wish I could go over there and do to those people that did that. And I think every man that has some balls and testosterone left in this country feels the same way that we do. They deserve to die. But the problem is they're fucking cowards and they're hiding their weapons and their, their attacks. They're doing their rocket attacks and they're launching all of this stuff and hiding all of their caches and their plans and their little underground chambers under hospitals, which Israel just proved yesterday under schools. And they're filling the places that they launch rocket attacks from and do things from with women and children so that when Israel retaliates from the rocket site, they're going to blow up a bunch of women and children. So when you fight fucking cowards, those cowards created this thing. If they weren't fucking cowards, then they would have moved all those women and children out of Gaza before they did that attack because they know what's going to happen. They use men and men and women and children, excuse me, as human shields and they want to sing "Woe is me" when they started this shit in the first place. Don't 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 fuck around, and you won't find out. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and no, Americans absolutely. need to remember how that goes. Because what scares me, really, with them simply wanting to get behind Hamas right now and support Hamas is what's going to happen the next time something tragic happens to America. Those little ass clowns are going to be dancing in the streets saying we deserved it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's. That's where we're at. Well, dude, we yeah, could go sorry. for days. No, don't be <laughs> sorry. This is good. I wish yeah. we actually we could go because, mm-hmm. uh, but, but I got I have a meeting uh, getting ready to no, start. No, all good, man. All but good. Um, yeah, I, I'd love to have you back on and talk mm-hmm. some more. And uh, anytime, uh, I really appreciate your service to the country. Appreciate you as a friend, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for you. So thanks for coming. Well, dude, th- thank you for having me. As always, love you, Ed. You've done some awesome stuff, man. I'm just honored to be your friend and. Get to do this journey of life with you, man, in a non-sexual gay way. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, brother.